look like their owners, individual owners.
council members are present and uh, accounted for. We'll begin with a uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the past Vice Chair White to lead us in that. Please rise if you are able. And repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now observe a, a moment of silence. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, first up, do we have any acknowledgments from the council? Okay. Um, we have first up uh, Mayor Nadalski. Chair, before oh, we get started, sorry, do you yeah. mind if I um, uh, ask for a change of reordering uh, the reports section? Yes, please. From seven, uh, just moving 7B before 7A. We have a motion to, to amend our agenda to move item 7B to 7A. Second. We have a second by Council Member Myers. This is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Very good. Thank you. I know we talked about that. Okay. Now we would like to invite uh, Mayor Nadolski to come uh, present on his blueprint for a stronger Ogden as 100-day review. So... <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the council, staff of the administration, staff of the council, members of the community and staff of, the, of this community. 100 days ago, I stood before you. It was a different time. I was a, felt like a different man. It may feel on some days that that was six years ago because we've accomplished a lot. A lot of the things that we've accomplished might not be obvious. It might not be things you can see or touch, but that's why we have a report to give today. Before I start my report, I want to thank the people that are behind me in the chairs for giving me the opportunity to be your mayor. This has been the honor of my life. I got a text message today from my daughter. She's 14 years old. Sometime at school today, she made her own campaign sign that says Nadalski 2048. It has a slogan underneath it. And it says, it's, a, it's not about me, it's about you. This has been a blessing for me and it's been a blessing for my family. <clears throat> that was a sign today that my kids are seeing what we're doing together. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to be your mayor and thank you for the opportunity to be a better man and to try and be my best every day. Not just for you, but for my kids. It's my number one goal to be a good husband and a good father, and this job has helped me with that. I'm here today to report to you our first 100 days together. As we get to our presentation, I wanna first just share with you the structure of the points that I'll share. I have asked not to be super long. Uh, some struggle after a certain hour, and I understand, because we all worked late. But I wanna start with why. And I don't say those words lightly, I say those words in the spirit of Simon Sinek, the author who teaches leadership. You start with why, you start with your purpose. And when it comes to a 100-day plan, we want to start with why we have a 100-day plan. What's important about 100 days? What's important about the transition of a new administration from old to new? What's important about opportunities for change? And then we'll talk about the values, the vision, and the priorities we set forth on day one, 100 days ago. And then we'll talk about some of the outcomes and early wins of our efforts, not all. And then we'll look ahead about moving forward together and some of the wins that we can expect as a result of the groundwork that we've laid in the last 100 days. So the first question is why? Why do we have a 100-day plan and why is 100 days and the first 100 days of a mayor important? 
Think about the things that one has to accomplish as mayor. I first have to meet the staff. We have 682-ish employees in this city, many of whom I still haven't met, but I've spent a lot of time getting to know the staff. Those were in the early days and I'm still in that work and I will be for quite some time because I don't just wanna see them and say hi to them, I wanna know them. I wanna know their name, but I also want them to know me. We spend a lot of time doing this because what happens is employees often feel a sense of uncertainty when there's change. It's just human nature. It's understandable and it's okay. Especially when it's political change, especially in 2024 in the United States with political dynamics being what they are. Times are hard right now in our nation when it comes to politics. That brings to the workplace for families and for our staff uncertainty. So I've been glad to have opportunities to talk to people and help address their uncertainty and hopefully give them some confidence. And a 100-day plan gives that to them. It's important when we do this work that we set clear expectations. When we set expectations, it does help to address uncertainty. But what it also does is it addresses the questions that they have about me. They wanna know what I want and they wanna know how they can help. And it's not just about me, it's about you, it's about Ogden. So our staff wanna know what Ogden needs and what Ogden wants through my lens. And by setting clear expectations, it gives them an opportunity to understand what those are. Now these first 100 days are important because if we don't do it with intention, then the outcome will happen for us. Not by us, the outcomes will happen for us. And we want to be in charge and in control of our outcomes. It's also a good opportunity for us to share what our values are. I made it really clear what my values are and I shared those with the staff, I've shared them with the community and with the council. We've seen a lot of uptake on what those values are. We have a lot of incredible people in this city that share those values and we're, we share them and we are wrapping ourselves around them in continuity and in, through the spirit of community. It gives us an opportunity to establish our vision. That vision should be set clearly in those shared values and this should be uh, based on our expectations. A vision gives us an opportunity to set priorities. Those priorities should be rooted in a vision, a vision that's rooted in our values, values that are rooted in our expectations for ourselves and for others. And then it gives us an opportunity to create connections. We have a lot of partners in this community, partners that want to stay connected with the city and new partners that want a connection with our city. And that takes a lot of work, but it's work worth doing. And finally, when we do this work and we do this work together, we create a team. Today on the agenda, we'll be hopefully putting the final piece into my leadership team with Jared Johnson. But the work that we've been doing has been to create a team. And when you create a team that's rooted in shared values, you create a culture. And when you use those values with that team to connect with people in our community and partners in our community, we create a culture not just for ourselves, not just for our organization and our staff, but a culture and an expectation for our community and for each other and with each other. And that is a recipe and is a catalyst for momentum. We have set the stage for a future of momentum. That is our why. That's why we were deliberate about our first 100 days because leadership in times of change Sure, it can be uncertain. Sure, it can create questions, but it can also be an opportunity. And the opportunity for us is to stand on the shoulders of those who come before us, to build on the work that others have done. We are not building a city, we are building a community. And we do that every day. It is a very active process. It takes time. So the values and the vision and the priorities that we shared before, start with a value statement. That Ogden is a community that is built by our people and for our people, all of our people. When our values are rooted in a statement that is based on our people, we begin to create a vision and priorities that serve others. That's why service is the most important value. Service to others, serving others selflessly. It was the motto of my daughter's campaign in 2048. I hope it works out for her. We serve others with integrity, 
when we serve others selflessly and we do so with integrity, it creates opportunities and relationships of trust. Trust doesn't just happen by itself. We have to act with transparency. Transparency is not a buzzword. It's an activity. It's something that should be rooted in everything that we do. It's also not just about what we put online. It's not just about how we handle our meetings. It's also about how we handle our conversations and our interactions in between. Part of being transparent is being available. It's being connected and it's being truthful in our conversations. It's making sure that we're accessible to the stakeholders that are affected by the work that we do and the decisions that we make. Transparency is a thing that should be rooted in all that we do. And we should make sure that we always carry with us a growth mindset. I met with Weber State today. They asked about growth. They love that we are hungry and that we have an insatiable appetite for growth. I hope that we share that within ourselves individually because there's always work to do. There's always things we can do to be better. And that's why humility is an important trait as well. We have to be humble enough to accept that we don't have all the answers ourselves. But we also have to be collaborative enough to know that we have, we have partners that do know and that together we can work together, grow not just in our individual capacities, but in our collective mindset and our collective capacity to be better. And finally, making data-driven decision-making an important part of how we manage our city. With a, with a vision in hand where we foster the health and wellness of our people and we create a physical, social, political, cultural, and economic environment that creates opportunities for all of our people to achieve their greatest potential. Our mission and our values and our priorities are rooted in helping individual people and all of us as a community collectively to achieve our greatest potential. If we focus our efforts on helping our people achieve their greatest potential, Ogden collectively will. If our people are not successful, Ogden won't be successful. And Ogden cannot be successful without our people succeeding. We can help achieve that by making policy priorities. You're gonna see from me in the same microphone and in the same chambers in the beginning of May, presenting to you my first budget proposal. We've had four out of five days working on just budget with the entire team. And we work on the budget every day in between and then we come back together and work on budget again. We've got more, one more day to cover CIP and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna present budget priorities that are based on these policy priorities the health and wellness of our people, and creating a physical, economic, social, cultural, and political environment to help our people succeed. Because we've laid this groundwork with our people and with our team, we have created a foundation for success. This is just a snapshot of some of the meetings that I have personally had, but I haven't had these meetings alone. These are partnerships and individuals and organizations that have reached out that we have connected with in the first 100 days of our administration. I don't attend these meetings by myself. Often our partners come with staff or they come with other partners that are uh, in the sphere of which they're influential. I also am uh, joined in these meetings by support staff. Every one of these meetings comes with work, work to be done. Whether that's me or someone in our staff, the city is working on all of these things for us every day. They cover government affairs, media relations, uh, attending events, community engagement, and speaking events. These are things that make us accessible and available. They're also opportunities for transparency, and they're opportunities for us to, to make it clear uh, what our priorities are for one another. And because we were very intentional about that in our first 100 days, every single one of these meetings, we were able to reflect back on what our vision is what our priorities are moving forward and how each of these organizations can help contribute to the uh, implementation of those priorities. And they also have an opportunity to share with us their values and how they reflect and join with ours. This has been a lot of work for a lot of people, but I'm very proud to say <clears throat> that we have made a lot of connections and we have a lot of strong relationships in this city and that we have a lot of partners that we get to lean on and uh, do work together to make sure that we are successful as a community. A few of the early wins of our efforts is that one, first and foremost, we built a team. A team is really important because without a team, you cannot build a culture. And you cannot build a culture without a team of people who buy into the values, who buy into the culture that you're creating. 
And when we build a culture both internally and externally, it gives us an opportunity to build partnerships. An example of leveraging those partnerships was 14 days into our administration, we started a legislative session. You heard in your uh, work session about a generational need for water. Provide clean, reliable drinking water for our city for years and years to come. And we were able to engage with our legislative partners and put together, put to action our team and our culture to get a $10 million legislative appropriation to help our people. And in so doing, to also help offset impacts of the Great Salt Lake. That was a win that happened because we did the work early and we did it hard and we did it fast. We've elevated communication within our staff and with our operations. I'm thankful to Mike McBride for helping me with the presentation. I'm also thankful for Mike McBride for following me in my footsteps and being there with me everywhere I need him. There have been times where I've been places and I thought to myself, I wish Mike was here. And I turn around and I'd see him. Remember the Ben Lomond basketball game? I can't express to you how good it feels to know that you've got people that care about you and they want to help you succeed because they want to help Ogden succeed. Mike stood at this mic last week and he said, I have stood for years for everything that's good and right for Ogden. And he stood for Jared that night and he stood for me and he continues to stand for all. I thank you for that and I thank all of the staff that continue to do the same for us. I've touched on the budget preparation. It won't be an easy budget year. We have a team of people digging into it and they're digging deep and it's really hard work. And I thank Lisa Stout and her staff and all of the department directors and support staff that have been in the budget retreats digging through numbers with us and helping me develop my first proposal. We're preparing to launch a general plan process. This is a generational opportunity for us to set a vision and to set a template for what we're gonna be and how we build ourselves in the future, not just downtown, but citywide. This is something that's long been needed. And we're prepared and are on the eve of launching that effort. It's gonna be a two year effort, you guys. It's that big, it's that hard, it's that heavy. But I'm really excited to know that we have the team that has been preparing and they are prepared. They are ready to roll. And, they've, and we've got the uh, contractors in support and we have a community engagement plan and we have transparency at the forefront and engagement and opportunities for all of us to, to be involved. That's the new norm. That's just what we do. We've developed opportunities for community, community conversations. Channel 17, we've done our first one to launch it and announce it. We'll be doing monthly uh, community conversations. We'll give community <coughs> members an opportunity to call in and ask me questions. I'll answer them live. I'll give the answers that I know and I'll defer when I don't. A lot of things happen in this city. I can't know everything but I try to know a lot and I'll share everything I know. And we've also had a, a big opportunity to step up and to lead in the unsheltered services space. And I wanna thank Mara Brown for her especially. This is an area where she asked to be involved and she has done an amazing job. I got a text today, Mara doesn't know this, from a staff member who said, I'm listening to a statewide meeting in the unsheltered services space. And someone just made a comment that they appreciate the engagement and leadership of the new Ogden City Administration. And I have, we all have Mara Brown to thank for that. We also have staff with Anna Davidson and others that are involved in those services every single day. These are just examples, you guys. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are the things that we've done early to establish the relationships and the connections with partners at the state level, national and federal levels, as well as local so that we can step into spaces and lead and begin to serve our people. I also wanna say something that is about outcomes that are, maybe some of them are seen, but there's also outcomes that are not seen. And I think those outcomes are just as important as the ones that you do see. A few of those examples that come to mind are the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, <laughs> the airport, and the Union Station. Now, well, that's not an example of bricks and mortar that we've built, but those are examples where we've engaged and we've engaged with honesty and integrity. We've engaged very authentically and personally. The mayor has personally engaged, the mayor has been involved, the fire chief's been involved, public mm -hmm. services through Justin Anderson and his team has been involved. 
It's been a team effort. Jared and Angela was involved in helping them to relocate to help make sure that they're providing services for wildlife rehabilitation. It may not be our mission to rehab wildlife, but the way we treat people, the way we treat others, that is our mission because that is our values. We treat others with kindness and we do it with grace. And in so doing, we may not agree with the decisions that we've made, and I can live with that. But they've treated us with respect because we've treated them with respect. That's what kindness does. Kindness and grace. The time has come, the deadline has passed. They've moved out and they're providing services for our community and beyond for injured wildlife. In the time of need in the spring where birds are being injured. And it's not nuclear, it's not toxic. It's not everything they'd hoped for. But they've told us that they respect the decision that was made. The airport has a long ways to go, you guys. But we've done a lot of work to connect with stakeholders, to listen to them, to give them an opportunity to vent their frustrations and to see what and to hear what they need. And in so doing, we've created a dynamic and an opportunity for us to engage authentically with the stakeholders that are affected by the decisions that we make and the policies that we establish. They're giving us input in, informally and authentically with the help of a third party, a contractor who's got expertise in airport and aeronautics, aviation and management. That third party is bringing to the table national practices and the spectrum of practices that can work for Ogden. And we're going to figure out solutions for our stakeholders and for our city. We're going to do business. We're going to make sure that we create an environment for our people to succeed in the Union Station. We've had a lot that we've thought about at the Union Station, but what we've lost sight of is all of the things that we believe and agree on. And we agree that history and our culture, our artifacts, and our station come first. Economic development comes second. So we're going to fast track and put to the forefront the establishment of our museums, the protection of our assets, and the, his and the protection of our history. That's the work that we're going to do moving forward. We're not going to do it by ourselves. We're going to do it with the help of the stakeholders that love that station, love our history, and are passionate about that work. So as we look forward to moving forward together, there are wins that are coming. We're just getting started. Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but if you look ahead, we'll launch that general plan. Again, a generational opportunity to plan our environment and our physical future. We have opportunities for technology and innovation integration. We have a, a community line for 311 where um, members of our community can call in and let us know about issues that we can help resolve. It's underway. It's being beta tested. It needs work. We're not going to roll it out until it's ready, but those are the kinds of things that have been worked on in our first 100 days. We're also working on the completion of past projects. There are a number of projects that are approved or organized that haven't been uh, built and gone vertical. We've seen some of them started to go vertical at one block. It took a lot of effort from a lot of people on the team. I'm really thankful of the efforts of everybody across the departments to make sure that worked. It only worked because they were all involved. So thank you to those that lost sleep, who worked late hours, to the spouses of those that made it happen, or missing the softball games, Jared, to be there to make sure that the city was taken care of and looked after. We've got to be in our ball games. Justin Anderson, you got two boys playing varsity baseball together. This is the only year that they'll be juniors and seniors, right? The only year they'll be playing varsity baseball together. They're in var <laughs> number one in the state. I heard they intentionally walked him. They didn't want him hitting a dinger on him. We have real people, real families with real opportunities to love and provide for their children. And they're stepping aside at times, but not always, to help make sure this city succeeds. Those are real sacrifices by families that I want to be really aware of to make sure that that's not something that becomes normal. As we complete those past projects, we can look ahead and develop an RFP and developer selection policy. Mara and the help of Lisa Stout and her staff, as well as staff uh, support and help from Jared Johnson and economic development staff, 
are evaluating RFP and developer selection policies across the state and across the country and looking for best practices that we can incorporate into our own. It will give us an opportunity to be transparent, to be competitive, and it may create a little bit of work on the front end, but every developer that I've talked to would love that opportunity because they want to compete, they want to earn our, the work, but they also want to earn the transparency and trust of the public. And if we make that investment on the front end, they feel that we'll have a lot better uh, success on the back end. There'll also be times where we are talking about tax increment financing and we've talked about opportunities for us to have third party reviews to not just, not just hand it over to them and have them tell us what they think, but for us to make sure that we're doing our own due diligence on tax increment and that we have a third party review in the numbers that we're arriving at and telling us if we're right or if we're wrong to make sure that we're offering the best deal for the people. We're also working toward a long-term financial sustainability model. You'll see in the coming budget that every city is, is facing challenges, particularly around sales tax. We'll have our own uh, challenges and we'll have opportunities or uh, recommendations for how to address them. But we can't budget it one year to the next, one year at a time. We have to be able to budget with the bigger picture set toward the future. That's a much bigger effort than it seems, but we are uh, finding a, a third party uh, consultant who's gonna help us with our long-term financial sustainability models, modeling. We are a big city with a big operation. We also have an influx of people during the day. We are an even bigger city every day. It's high time that we do a staffing study to see if we have appropriate level of staff to find out if we are providing the appropriate level of service with the staff that we have, that we're not overburdening or underburdening our staff as well. Again, that's a tremendous effort and a study that's gonna be ongoing. And we'll start that study as soon as we finish the current one, which is looking at employee compensation to make sure that we're equal <coughs> or on par with the market. I mentioned the citizen reporting tool, 311. That'll be an opportunity coming. And we heard about the Canyon Waterline implementation. That might be a little bit messy, that might take a long time, but that's gonna save us a lot of water and it's gonna provide water for generations to come. And if anybody's driven down 20th Street, you'll find that there's a section that's heaven and a section that's something else. <laughs> and our team has been working really hard to secure grants and funding to make sure that we finish what they started at 20th Street. And it's gonna all be heaven when they're done. And finally, the Union Station. We have our development partners and our partners at the UTA for the Union Station. We are all in agreement along with our community, that our history and our culture and our artifacts and our station are our priority. And I'm happy to say that I just met with the Olympic organizers today. That's where I was before this meeting. The Olympics is a thing that can bring a lot of synergy and a lot of vision to an, op an opportunity for a community. It's something that we can all latch onto. It's a vision that we can all share and, and it also comes with a timeline. If the Olympics are 10 years away, that might sound like a long ways away. It's not. Not when you consider all the work that has to be done. But we're in agreement with our development partners and with UTA that the Olympics are a great time for us to welcome the world back to our foot doorsteps through the Union Station and through that grand lobby. Just like we welcomed the world when we became who we are today. The world came to our footsteps on that rail line. They walked through that grand lobby. They walked down 25th Street. They discovered Ogden and its opportunities for the first time. And I really want to make sure that we as a community prepare to welcome the world back through those same door, doorsteps. We can do that by making sure that we lead out with a restoration campaign for the Union Station, that we join forces with our community, we don't fight, we collaborate to make sure that we are on the same page, that we go after a community campaign for restoration, that we go after fundraising we do it through private sources and government, that we engage our legislators for help at the state level because we own and we are stewards of our state's history, our state's railroad history, not just Ogden's. We're gonna need all the help we can get. We also have congressional delegation and congressional partners that we wanna ask for help. And they're anxious to help. They love Ogden. They also love our history. It's gonna be an all hands on deck. We can't afford to fight. There's too much to fight for. We can't afford to fight each other. 
So that's something that I look forward to implementing and announcing. And we'll do that over time because collaboration is our catalyst, you guys. The opportunities before us now with the vision set, with the planning in place, with the general plan coming for us to cast our vision, do it in a collaborative way, and then use our collaboration with one another as partners to be our catalyst for our success and for our future. I thank you for this opportunity to report back to you on my first 100 days. I thank you for this opportunity to be your mayor. I hope you have seen that we have created a new way for you to engage with us. I congratulate again the two new council members that started on the same day and the same moment and instance that I started this job. I know you both are on an adventure that you've never been on before. So am I. We're in this adventure together. I've sat in both of those seats at one point or another. And I've shared that title of District 4. I know what it means and I know the pressures that you're under. I know how hard it is to be a council member for all of you guys. You sit here and you own the decisions that we make as an administration. And sometimes you have to take the hits that come with that. And I don't want to set you up like that. I want to involve you in our discussions and our deliberations early. Because I want you to understand and I want you to feel as strongly about the decisions we're making as we do. So it's not just about doing it differently for our people that we serve, it's about doing it differently for each other. It might be 2024 and politics might be what it is in the United States of America, but it doesn't have to be that way in Ogden, Utah. And I thank each of you for the work that you've done, the grace that you've extended to me, the grace that you've extended to our team, and helping to make sure that that is the case for all of us. We cannot build a community by fighting. We build our community by collaborating. God bless each of you. God bless everyone who's here. Thank you to my family for who supported me. You guys, it's really something to work with you. Thank you for the honor to be your mayor. Thank you for making me a better man, for helping me to be a better husband and a better father after work. I look forward to the next 100 days and beyond. We won't be accounting for our future in 100 day increments, I promise. You won't have to hear me anymore. <laughs> but it's important that you see me, that you hear me, and that the people that live here do the same. Because when they say that Ogden's mayor is Ogden's cheerleader, this is what it means. The energy that I carry makes a difference in the energy of the people that work here. I can't afford to have bad days. Neither can you. When we have bad days with each other and for each other, where people feel it and they see it. Let's make sure we do this and do it right, do it together. We'll make mistakes. I certainly have. But let's make sure that we do it right. We do it for you, we do it for us, we do it for Ogden. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Nadolski. Appreciate that report. I don't know if there are any council members who would like to. Well, thank you. Sure. Are there any council members who'd like to make a comment or, or make any questions or, yeah. Okay, I just wanna say thank you again as well. I, um, you know, I, I do think it's been a very busy 100 days and I, it, that list of events, it, was, it only took like two times before I realized they were color coordinated for a reason. And that, so that's, that's me, but um, from, our, from our standpoint, I do appreciate the the collaborative uh, nature of, of um, the ability to communicate and having a more of an open dialogue with the administration and directors and even Mara uh, asking for potential forgiveness for possibly oversharing on, on some things. But we as council members love to hear information um, ahead of time as much as possible. And so that's, that's great. And um, yeah, 20th Street, that would be nice to finish that one off too. Um, all righty. With that, we'll, uh, we'll move into approval of minutes um, from the joint session of March 12th, 2024. Councilmember Blair. Yes, thank you, Chair Ritchie. I have reviewed those minutes and found them to be accurate, and I would make a motion that we have, uh, yeah, and make a motion that we approve those minutes. A second. second. Okay, motion by Councilmember Blair to approve the minutes, second by Councilmember Graf. <laughs> <laughs> it was so somewhat, somewhat, somewhat simultaneous. Uh, this is a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. That passes. 
Next up, we have a public hearing and we'll invite, invite our planning manager, Barton Brierley, to come to discuss a, an extended item from February 20th, 2024, the proposed, <coughs> the proposed partial street vacation of Cahoon Street between F Avenue and G Avenue. Barton. Okay, good evening, Chair Ritchie and city councilors. This is a, was a request to vacate a portion of Cahoon Street So the section requested for vacation is just west of F Avenue. It's a 173 foot long portion of the street. The applicant would like to vacate that. They own property on both sides of the street and would like to vacate the street so they could consolidate the property and do a development on there. This happens to be near the 24th Street interchange and UDOT is working now to redesign that interchange. And that is going to trigger a number of changes in the area that we'll have to look at access and zoning and most importantly and related to this is utilities. Uh, we'll need to get a major water line through this area to and across the airport uh, across the freeway into the airports. And so we're evaluating those options and we believe that a, it's potential that we'll need to put a water line through there. Because the UDOT has not finalized their plans for that, we still don't know exactly where all the rights away will be and where that water line will be. Uh, but at this point, staff recommends that we not vacate it so that we leave that available in case that is the preferred location for the major water line. The Planning Commission heard this and uh, voted to recommend denial of the app, the vacation by a 9-0 vote. At your February 20th meeting, uh, staff would recommend a denial and the City Council extended it. And it uh, remains staff's recommendation that you deny the requested vacation. Um, that's not to say this couldn't come back at some later time when we've done more analysis and might have a different recommendation, but at this point, it's our recommendation to deny the vacation. Thank you, Barton. Any questions for Barton? We do have the petitioner here, um, but any questions for Barton? I don't know if it's better. Maybe we'll let the petitioner go first and then I'll see if I still have the question. Okay. Petitioner, if you'd like to come and address the council on this. Just state your name for the, the record. State my name clearly. Perfect. Luke Kennard. Um, live in Pleasant Grove now. We moved since the last time that I uh, <laughs> met with you guys. So homeowner now, yes. <laughs> um, thanks. Thanks for uh, the chance to meet with you. You're pretty aware of our project. We've talked to you guys a few times, right? Um, so our, we want to be collaborative. Our, we understand it would be great if we could get an acceptance tonight. I don't think that's realistic, right? Uh, so our ask is an extension again. I'll give some uh, reason for that. Uh, it, it seems like since our last meeting, there's uh, some discussion on uh, further clarification from UDOT, and then they bumped their meeting. So between Last time and this time, there's no updates from UDOT, therefore no updates from engineering on what can be done. Um, another reason why we want to extend is we've been reconfiguring the, the site plan and concept and uh, we were hoping for you know an approval for vacating Cahoon Street, but now that we're in this uh, muddy water, we've reconfigured it to have a, a, zone, a phase one and a phase two. Um, Steve potentially sent that to you guys. Were you able to review yeah, he, that? Yeah, he did. He did okay. send that. So okay, so we've got a we've got a phase one that doesn't touch Cahoon Street at all. Phase two would be if we can work something out with Cahoon Street, right? Um, I'll pause right there. I've got some other points, but any questions about that so far? So I guess I did want just a little clarification on what you're saying, because from what I'm seeing on the layout, um, I can't really tell where the phase one and phase two is, I guess. There's, there's a line about like two-thirds 
uh, if you're looking at it I kind to, of, the yeah, left. I see the rectangle. And there's like a rectangle that says phase one, phase two development line. So phase one wouldn't touch Coon Street to but give time to yeah, figure I guess everything I'm out. To right. See how that relates to the um, extending the street vacation because you could still do that even if it's denied tonight, right? Uh, so the the other question is um, so here we'll go into my next points. That's okay. Because so so your question is, can we still do phase one even if we don't have phase two? Right. Could we? Yes, potentially. So now now the question is, um, is it worth it to do a water line through Cahoon Street? What's been addressed in previous meetings is, um, you know, that's a potential path. You don't want to give it up. Totally get that right. It's it's city property. You had your D Avenue incident, right? You don't want to have to take property back. Um, Western portions of Cahoon Street have been uh, vacated in the past. If if you look at the the current, uh, so what's west of us, right? In in our last meeting, we talked about eminent domain, right? We weren't talking about if if you vacate the street test and then you have to eminent domain it back. We were talking about uh, there's. Uh, break time Bob's and uh, Zach and his commercial building to the west of us. If you bring a water line up from, I don't know where it's coming from and exactly where it's going, I'm not sure, right? But the options are 24th Street, potentially 25th Street, Cahoon Street. So if Cahoon Street is a viable option, then I, I just kind of like to maybe challenge, like how much does it actually cost to go through Cahoon Street? Because you're going to have to... Um, acquire an easement or acquire property that goes through a building and um, if you're doing that uh, you know break time Bob's value is three million Zach's property two million that's what they've mentioned to us and so um, how viable is it to go through Cahoon Street uh, you know engineers have told us 24th Street 2.4 million Cahoon Street 5 million so if, if it's like, yes, we should deny this because Cahoon Street the, is the best option, we don't want to give it up, is it really a viable option? Um, my, my request is like, is there any data-driven decision based off of Cahoon Street being uh, the real viable option? And if it is a viable option, who are we, right? That's your best option. Um, you can deny the vacation, right? If it, is a vi if it isn't a viable option, um, We've got a great plan for that <laughs> land, and so we'd like to implement that. So um, that's why we're asking to extend. And hopefully that answers your question is a little bit roundabout, but <laughs> what could we do with the portion? So yeah, deny it tonight. Uh, we don't get the option to do phase two right now, right? We'd love to do it all together, but we do phase one. We do uh, phase two later in a development agreement. We'd like to extend because you know, UDOT, again, we don't have any updated information from UDOT, and is it a viable option? So, questions. Okay. Any questions at this point? I, I have a question, but not for the petitioner, right? Okay. I yeah, if so. we want to have, yeah. well, we have, so we have, um, we have public comment, so it's a public hearing. Um, I don't know if there's a question for Barton at this point, or do we want to take public input or the, the public hearing on this, and then we can have a discussion on the council on that? Sounds like your question. My more. question really is for Barton. So, okay. Do you want Barton? Do you want to come up and thank you? Thank, thank you. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Barton. So, just <clears throat> to clarify my thinking, I, I remember when we listened, when we heard this the first time. And the, uh, the intention was, I, I believe, is that we wanted this to be extended until the data came in. And that's why it was an extension instead of a table. And that, uh, I, I guess, maybe I can't remember exactly how our communication plan, how that happened afterwards. Maybe that's what's dictating this. Um, but it seems like uh, the the expectation was that we'd have some data before this thing actually came back to us. Steve, Just to wanna... avoid uh, having to have a have the, the petitioner expend, expend the other phase to, to petition again. 
and this guy. So, so Steve, yeah, if you want to comment on that, because you you presented the communication plan, I think two weeks ago, maybe last week in work yep. session. Yep. So um, it was it was initially extended back in February so that the petitioner could have conversations with the engineering division. Um, and as a result of those conversations, um, the applicant was hoping that UDOT would be able to provide engineering with some more um, concrete information about their plans for the interchange. Um, uh, I believe it was last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, that um, it, it was two weeks ago. Engineering said UDOT doesn't have their plans finalized yet, and engineering recommended that the, the project be denied for that reason. Um, so there was there was there were talks of having conversations with UDOT for more information, but um, those conversations, I think, because of UDOT, didn't happen. I think we and we hadn't heard from engineering either, and so that's in two weeks ago we had that opportunity to hear directly from Justin and his group. So, yeah. I guess the follow-up question for that would be, what would be the downside of extending again? Um, I think the timeline is, well, at least from my understanding, is that we really don't know what UDOT's going to do and if it's yeah. six months, if it's five years, if it's... Well, uh, yeah. th that's the point of the extension, though, is it, it isn't time-specific. You know, maybe it does go to the fall. Um, I personally yeah. wouldn't have a problem with that. But maybe, maybe there's another reason that I'm unaware of that it yeah. needs to be resolved. Any other thoughts? That's just what my, can, my question was, too. I was waiting to see what developed between these conversations. Because sometimes just having emails coming back, back and forth don't really dictate what the conversations have been. So I guess that's my question, too. Um, you were saying that they would have to come back and petition for a rezone also anyway. So, But that would not include this vacation. That would be a separate. Based on the project, the, the amended project, it would require a rezone. Yeah, so it'd yes. be separate. They wouldn't do it at the same time. So that's my only argument for saying, why not just extend it rather than having people to have to pay another fee for the same purpose. But whatever works. Okay. Well, maybe let's let's go ahead and um, move yeah. to public input yeah. on this. Yeah. If you'd like to come and address the council on this item, uh, please state your state your name for the, recor the recorder and uh, limit your comments to three minutes. If you're online, you can raise <laughs> your hand to uh, uh, be recognized there as well. Hi, Travis Pate. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to speak on this before, and the dynamic is the property immediately west of this was not vacated by any means. It just barely became logged in the city about four years ago because Weber County had unincorporated essentially island parcels, that's when that portion became part of Ogden City. Uh, until then, it was unincorporated Weber County. And so the dynamic of trying to weigh apples to oranges and, and saying vacate it because there was already a vacation west, there was not. Ogden City didn't vacate any property because we didn't own the property. And so that dynamic to me, again, trying to bend water, you can't. You can, but it's very expensive. It's called thrust blocks and you have water coming one direction that wants to continue that direction. It's Newton's law, objects in motion want to stay in motion. But then to have to bend the water and everything else versus a uh, consistency of water line and, and those other types of dynamics. But I, 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 I feel for the petitioner and I think the extension, whether it's uh, um, a year or six months or anything else, it's almost double taxation if you deny it today and say, come back again. Whereas if you just say, we'll extend it to a date indefinite, which is an extension, which is a possibility because of that, if it's tabled, yes, date definite. And so I think the dynamic to me, again, if it's just waiting for this, it should have possibly been rescheduled from this meeting. It should have been an agenda item right at the start said, we want to bump up from this meeting and wait till it, we hear from UDOT. It's pretty user friendly, both directions. And so I think that's the dynamic is when you look at history for the properties, it frustrates me to no end when the history of the properties aren't all inclusive. And we can look at that for the essentially the Lynn area community plan. You got a lot of things that keep coming up and yet you guys yourselves have done a heritage historic for Ogden's oldest community. The Shoshone were right there first long before the Western civilizations came in and yet we continue to rezone and all those types of things. So 
it, it would be it wouldn't be wise to it would be wise to extend this and allow all the parties that need to be at the meeting to be at the meeting. Thanks. Thanks, Travis. We have uh, Angel Castillo online. Good evening, Angel Castillo of Den Rosevic. Um, I would like to speak in support of Council Member Heyer and Council Member Chaburka's questions about making sure that uh, everybody has time to be at the table and, of course, not causing more fees. I think it's a marvelous opportunity if we extended this for the developer acting in the spirit of faith, uh, good faith from Mayor Nadolsky's new administration and the remarks he made earlier about um, changing process and changing plan. It seems like we just need some more time. And if the developer has adequate time to work their way through UDOT and find out where we are, and as uh, Mr. Pate had mentioned, make sure that we have community involvement so we're all at the table. I believe that if you extended this, we could be sending the message that we are definitely being more transparent and collaborative and that uh, we will have all of the opportunities explored so that developers coming to work with us don't feel like they've been cheated, railroaded, or pushed through a decision. So um, I'd like to ask you to go ahead and extend this again and whatever time frame you want to put on it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anybody else? Welcome. Hello, my name is Alan Jones. I'm an Ogden City resident. Uh, as uh, some of you all know, that I'm typically opposed to vacating any Ogden City streets for various reasons. Uh, however, in this particular case, I think I would support extending this but not for an infinite amount of time. I personally think that uh, we ought to pick a date in the future and either succeed or not succeed in this project and then make the decision at that point. But I don't, I don't support having an infinite six extension. So I think a, a reasonable extension would be appropriate. Thank you, Al. Yeah, welcome. Yep. Hi, my name is Tyler Gray. I'm the actual property owner. And uh, we've been working faithfully with you guys um, for, for a while. Um, I'd love for an extension. I'd really love for an approval, but I, I don't see that happening today. Um, you know, we want to beautify Ogden City. We want to make that west side pop and give people a lot of reason to be over there because we know that it's been ran down a little bit. And I'd love to see it uh, be beautiful, just like that whole entire bridge going all the way over the UDOT extension. I mean, all that is going to beautify Ogden City and everybody that's going to be coming into our city because I'm, I own multiple uh, properties in Ogden are going to take that route and I want them to see how beautiful we can make it together. So however we can work together to make this happen, I'd love to work with you and that's what I got to say today. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Teresa Bramwell. I wasn't expecting to want to speak on this issue, but I will, uh, because this thought came to my mind while I was sitting here listening to all these folks. Um, the last vacation that I heard about in this meeting was the one on 18th Street next to the Ogden River, and I sat through those meetings kind of questioning how that all came to be and why it was happening and why it was allowed to happen. Um, and in the end, my philosophy about it was the reason why it was allowed to happen is because Ogden City was behind it and they were selling their building right on the river to become some sort of a commercial space. 
and in order to allow the developer to have an easier time to do all that, the street was vacated and then sold to the developer for I think $18 a foot or whatever the price was. And so thinking back on that experience, I wonder why this experience would be different. Because this is a much less visible place in Ogden. I don't even know where this place is that they're talking about today. I'm sure I've never set foot on it. Um, and I've never seen it. I've seen the thing on the river 2,000 times at least every day of my life. Uh, so that's going to be a giant apartment complex that, that this city gifted to the developer of that. And we're going to get to see it every day. This is something that almost nobody will see. This guy's come to you and said, hey, I really would like to do this. I'm sure he's willing to pay for the land, just like the other developer did. And so I wonder why these people would be treated differently because I don't think they should. Not that I agree or disagree with it. I just don't think they should be treated differently. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on this item? If not, I'd take a motion to close the public hearing on this. So moved. Second. Motion by Council Member Heyer, second by Vice Chair White to close the public hearing on this item. Uh, this is a voice vote, all in, is a voice vote, right? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes. <clears throat> All right, discussion in the council? Or council, or Mayor Nadolski, you have a comment? I, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just wanted to share a few thoughts. I actually met Tyler and his wife. That, all those bubbles in the meetings that you saw there, one of them was a meeting with a bunch of um, local investors, people that are working their butt off to, uh, to make impacts around northern Utah. These two were two of the people that were in attendance. Um, I'll tell you one thing I learned is how much they care about Ogden. And the hard thing about this was that no, no one's wrong and no one's done anything wrong. If, if not for their proposal, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't have realized that we are in need of some serious attention in that interchange area. We know we're gonna work toward a new interchange. We know that's, that's gonna change the game. We talked about the Union Station and Welcome to the World at the doorsteps, 24th Street and that interchange is gonna play an important role in that too, to, to welcome the world into our downtown through that, that uh, entrance to our downtown. And so we stumble into our challenges, honestly, and, and together. So um, hopefully I, it would be nice if our staff had an opportunity to talk with council about the phases that are um, proposed, but also if necessary or needed, I don't think there's been any wrongdoing by anybody in our staff or by the uh, petitioners. And if the angst is around the fees that are associated with the petition, which they are, they can be significant. If there's opportunities for leniency, we can talk about that too. There's, there ought to be opportunities for honesty and um, good faith. So I just wanted to put that out there for your decision making that if there's needed leniency in those ways and also needed time for um, more communication, we have our engineering teams here for whatever questions council member hire has um, but we're also willing to lend our entire team to the council staff and council members for whatever questions you might have and to the petitioner and the owners all right any any discussion okay. vice chair white it looked like you might yeah. need yeah. a move for the sorry microphone. i have a question um if we extend it and it's in this extension period um that means that the developer can't start and is that correct or can they start on their phases and decide they don't want to do the petition? How does that work? Steve. Just a, just clarification, when you say start. So, so my question is if we extend it to some indefinite time and, then, and, and you do, does not move fast, but let's say a, a year's period, let's say we decide, can they start their project uh, their phase one project, still even the though there is an. Oh, yeah. They'll, yeah, so they'll need the rezone on that. Pro, pro, yeah, yeah, for sure. So, but they could still concurrently have two petitions. Is that what the question yes. is? Yeah. And start their project. It, it depends on what they propose and if it goes through the administrative Correct. process. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and that's kind of what I was asking too. But. Yeah. Yeah. 
But, yeah, and I think um, the statement about not wanting to extend forever, um, when we extend something, we don't put a date on it, but we could say until some activity happens, right, like we did the last yeah. time. So it, it wouldn't be just forever, but like until X, you know, we can determine what that is. I think the other thought with that, and again, this is an extreme, but we extend it until UDOT decides what to do. We could have different people sitting up here yeah. on this item in five years, right? I mean, that's certainly a possibility. So, I mean, just things to think about. Yeah, I, I guess I, if, yep. if, the, if the trigger was the petitioner bringing it back, I'd be okay with that. Uh -huh. they, they've got all the data they need. They've got all the ammunition they need to, to, to convince us to, to grant their petition, or they don't, uh, and it just stays in, you know. Extension. I, I, don't, I don't have a real issue with that. It doesn't cost the city anymore for this thing to go on, but it gives the petitioner an opportunity to bring it back if and when they want to. Janine, Janine, like Janine is, there a, is there a yeah, cost to the ask? council? Or a, or well, what's I, the... I just think it's, it's really out of the norm, and we always try to be consistent to leave a petition that there's not been any, that's just sitting there forever with no action. Mm -hmm. I think that there should be some action with some within some reasonable period of time. I guess you can decide what that is. What that is, yeah. And not just put it on the petitioner to bring it back when, whenever. Sure. I think I think it would be better for, for the council and for the records and for the recorder and everybody else to yeah. have it resolved at some reasonable time. So, so maybe that that begs the question then: at what point? What's holding you dot up? I mean, is it? It's you dot. It's you dot. <laughs> <laughs> it's you. It's you. Al, you, yeah. you can't say that in this meeting. <laughs> they said it first. Let's, uh, Mayor. Do you have a comment? I, I think Council Member. Uh, hires got a lot of questions for engineering and they're anxious to answer as well. Yeah. So Taylor Nielsen's our Yeah, Taylor, do you mind this coming up and right just addressing the engineering piece here? Uh, I can address the engineering and UDOT. Uh, Taylor Nielsen, I'm the city engineer here at Ogden. I uh, actually had a meeting earlier today with UDOT where we were trying to formalize some more timelines and everything else, trying to figure out what was next and what was happening because like you or we are quite anxious for something to happen with the 24th Street interchange. Trying to make some adjustments, trying to look long term at potentially what the next steps would be and what we can do. And so the mayor was correct in his earlier comments, trying to ensure that we're planning this portion of the city for a long term vision, uh, not just taking it one piece at a time, which is unfortunately what's happened in some places in the city, but looking at these items holistically, <laughs> wanting to make sure that we're making decisions for the long term. In so doing, sometimes that causes some of these other processes to slow down. So in order to try and align uh, the general plan updates, some of the area plan adjustments we'd have to do, and our utility plans, that's why we were anxious to talk to you guys. So the, the long portion is when we started asking them, they were identifying times in September and October when they would have what's called the plan in hand phase. They were bringing some of those items back. The other item that we actually found out today is they're starting their open house series. I believe there's going to be an open house next Thursday. Uh, I sent something to Mike McBride actually today because I found out. So we're going to be trying to announce that on our website. So that was new information that came out to us. Um, it was interesting. We, I looked it up on their website and you had a couple of items they need to <laughs> correct date wise. It's Wednesday the 18th, but that's probably not this year because that would be Thursday the 18th if you look at your calendar. So stuff like that that we're trying to work through. So those meetings are starting. And we're trying to ensure that we're getting the one really visible, really highly going to be bustling access to our city planned out and taken care of the right way. And so our, our opinion from the engineering group, and I know that we've shared this with our planning group, is this is truly a generational project that we feel like we have the opportunity to get it right the first time and once. We don't, we don't get redos, nor should we try and go after redos. So we're trying to make sure these all items line up correctly. So when we had talked to the petitioner before, those were the same concerns that we had extended, is that if it comes down to us vacating and being wrong, we didn't want that as an opportunity to come back. We wanted to make sure that we do have these properties, we do have some opportunities, we have a unique chance to reduce some land over there and really build some great things to come in the future. And so that was our proposal back is that 
it makes sense that we figure these items out first before even considering uh, the vacation. Now, probably one final item. I'm not a planner. I know that this was something that uh, Barton would, would talk about, but so there was a, a question on the phase one of their development. I believe they would still have to go through a rezone mm -hmm. of those items. So yeah. there's, there's still quite a few steps that staff can work on with them on phase one of their development that would probably be very well handled at the staff level that we can work through. But as far as this vacation, if, if it were to be acted on today, we would ask for a denial to have the opportunity to plan this area correctly and to move forward with that. So, so one other comment, and maybe I'm getting my developments mixed up, but wasn't there a comment made that this, this the utilities could actually continue on out and go on out to the airport as well? We, we have an opportunity, yes, that so we would try and carry. regardless of the 24th Street in interchange, there might be an opportunity to do something else? I mean, is that what you had said uh, earlier? No, because of the 24th because Street interchange, of... yes. Uh, it's, it's not often we can punch a 24-inch line uh, underneath I-15 and save a lot of cost. So that, that's another item that we were talking about today with UDOT is we're trying to say, okay, we need to have team meetings with your design group, with everyone else. Uh, of the items we talked about was storm drain alignment, where that would end up, uh, sewer crossings, and then of course our water line transmission, and then trying to fix some distribution lines that are over in this area. So that's why when, when you have a 24 inch water line, that's, that's what we're discussing. And uh, that's what makes it difficult to try and ensure that we have the preserved corridors to make it through where we need to and try at all possible costs to avoid UDOT roads, to avoid the petroleum lines, the high pressure gas mains, and some of the other you know, high cost infrastructure that's in that area, and try and make sure we have all available means to us so that we can plan this area correctly. So one other quick question. So you're not saying that they can't start on their phase one because of the 24th Street interchange, it's just that vacation of the street. When, when we had talked to them about their original proposal, they had come back and said, if we developed within our land, uh, would you be opposed to that? Uh, we, we are not opposed to people developing their property. I know that there's other items that would go along with that plan that they need to work on staff, but as far as developing their own property, we, we are not opposed to people doing that. Chair, I, I had a little chat with Janine over here. You might have okay. seen me kind of. Yeah. And, and, uh, there is an expanse to the city if we do extend because it'll need With to be renoted. Notice it, yeah. Um, and so it sounds like from what we're hearing from Taylor that perhaps if we if we tabled this to, and Janine came up with the date of October 15th, which I looked at and it is a Tuesday, uh, and maybe it'll all happen by then, it would save us the, the cost, cost to, of re -notice to, to re notice. Uh, it wouldn't come back until that time though. And so I don't know if the petitioners got a thumbs up f for that or not. Well, and I wonder if October 15th is far enough away because he's saying open, like they're, th they're, they're saying starting open. Yeah, maybe we, November. We could pick better. a date, yeah. I yeah, guess. Yeah. But I'm just saying maybe November instead. Yeah. The other, other point or question I had in Mayor, I don't know, I mean, if we declined, if we denied this yeah. petition and it went to, and then the city, I mean, this is a big deal, this interchange, right? And so, if the city were to work with the petitioners in developing that area and then it comes back to us from the city standpoint, is that a possibility? And what yeah. do you, you know, what's your thoughts on that? Thanks for the question and the opportunity. Um, you heard yeah. the complications from the engineering standpoint, infrastructure and planning. Um, I'm not even sure if you mentioned the railroad, the rail lines that are in that area. I have never seen a more complicated piece of real estate in our city and it all converges in the same place. And so that's kind of why I was saying there's no fault of the owner or the developer or the staff. It's the complicated dynamics all pile onto each other in one place with all of those infrastructure overlapping one another, 24 inch rail uh, line punched underneath I-15, potential for, the, for running it to other areas for services that had long been needed, multiple ownership of multiple rail lines that that some overlap, some don't. New proposals that we're hearing about but we're not clear on from, from rail industry in that area. Um, plus the SPUI, a single point user interface interchange at 24th Street with a completely different footprint 
and where that winds up, we're not even sure. They're only in the environmental phase, I think, right now in the open house, right? So that's an early environmental impact phase of the of the overall planning, and then we still have funding and implementation. It's years years out, and so I offered that opportunity for relief and some sort of uh, good faith opportunity for relief because if we extend it forever, <laughs> that's not a good way to operate. It's not good to put people in limbo like that, especially people that are operating in good faith and that care about that city. And it just creates an opportunity if we if we deny it and or if you guys deny it and we offer um, some relief within the whatever policy allows, I'll have to ask the team. It just creates an opportunity for us to reward their good faith with good faith, give our team the time to work with UDOT and others, and to help make sure that they are in fairness a part of the future of that interchange. This is not an effort to kick you out of an opportunity. Um, you own ground there. We want you to be a part of its future. But its future is so complicated, we just can't give you certainty as to what it is. And so we're being asked to guess, and that's an uncomfortable place to put the staff. And it and this kind of putting you in limbo forever puts you guys in an uncomfortable place. So if you choose to deny it, we'll do everything we can within policy and ordinance to, to offer relief. That's okay. And is that a potentially an opportunity for you know CED to get involved and in maybe helping to make this even something greater than we all imagine it yep. might be? We've even talked about having to hire a third party to help with the planning because rail line expertise is not just off the shelf. That's a an area of significant expertise combined with our infrastructure expertise, combined with planning, overlaid with our general plan, the layers are significant. So we are gonna need third party help and every department in our city's help on planning for this area um, before we're able to give certainty to the landowners and the developer. Sounds good. Yeah. Any any more discussion on the council, mem council members, <laughs> council member Blair? I don't know if you had a comment there. No, that's, that's the direction I was leaning to was I, I appreciate council member Heyer and, and others trying to, because I've had that concern a lot too, is I hate to, I hate to deny something and then have someone have to reapply and go through that process again and pay again. So I appreciate the mayor and the administration for addressing that and understanding that that is a burden and a hardship for people and, and a reason that, that, that might, we might want to be creative to get around that so that they don't have to do that again. Um, however, it, it sounds to me like the administration is willing to work with um, with them. Um, it sounds like no matter what, they're they've they've broken their their project now into two pieces. Those the, the first piece still has steps that need to be taken, and I think I just feel like with what we've just discussed and and, and maybe denial of, of this entire thing that we were not putting it off and putting it off and keep waiting and waiting and 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 and, and setting expectations i think this is a better way to 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 stop this but but then start from tonight to move towards a, a phase one and and move towards the you know the i don't want to say a different plan but but a, a segmented plan yeah so Council that's member. that's all i wanted to say and i appreciate like i said i appreciate both everybody for for I don't want to say chiming in, but yeah. providing input. Does Council Member Graff or Myers have any, any other thoughts or you, think yeah. you have a chance to share? Thank you, Chair. I would like to express, I love the, I love the project. I think it's a great idea. Vacating that, that street is, uh, gives me heartburn. So perhaps uh, petitioning to get the rezone starting on your project, that's, that's a way forward for you to get started, not have to wait through the bureaucracy of, of waiting. For UDOT or anybody else. So I don't know if that's uh, appealing to you, but if, if we were to put this off and consider it, my thoughts are let's just do the rezone. You can get started at a later time. If, you, if it, when the dust clears, we can see how the land there on Cahoon works out, if that can be vacated or not. But that's my reservation. I, I don't want to put you in limbo waiting for a long period of time. When you're excited about a project and you want to go, great to go. Councilman McGrath, any thoughts? Uh, just, uh, I'd make a motion if you'd like. Yeah, I, I, I can take a motion. All right. Regarding the petition to vacate a portion of. If the motion's to. Oh, so go ahead, Council Member Graff, go ahead with your motion. Regarding the petition to vacate a portion of Cahoon Street in West Ogden between F Avenue and G Avenue, I move to deny the petition. 
petition. Second. Okay, we have a motion to deny the petition by Council Member Graff and a second by Council Member Blair. This is Discussion. a. I'm sorry? Discussion before we come. Yeah, before we move to the vote, any other discussion, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know that it's, it's an either or thing. It, that's kind of where I am kind of confused by this thing is I think the street vacation is a separate issue to the to the rezone anyway. And so I, I think that they could, I mean, even if we did table the, the street vacation, they're still going to have to bring back a rezone right. and they're going to have to go through the process to get their, their project approved. Um, in, in addition to that, it, and so if they're if they're willing and want to go with a phase one, phase two approach, um, I don't see that 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 we that a denial is necessarily in the best interest because they if we if we table it, they still can do all those things which they had to do anyway. So mm -hmm. I don't see it's either or. I don't. I just don't see it that way. Agreed. Yeah, I think uh, from my perspective, um, with the comments from the mayor, a denial doesn't rule out rule out future opportunities to collaborate and work on this. And it sounds like there's some leniency well, there. I, I would agree; it doesn't yeah. rule those things out. It just it's going to cost more. But that's the I think that's the point: is it potentially doesn't cost more, yeah. right? If that's well, I guess I didn't uh, understand that. I, <laughs> did yeah. that. If the mayor can waive their fees, that's great. But I think it's also yeah. I mean, and I'm not trying to place any thoughts or ideas about certain people and bad actors or anything like that. We often have situations where people have said to us, I mean, throughout my years on the council, this one person told me that this thing could happen and it's not an ordinance and it's not in their policies and it's not in their rules and it's not possible for it to happen. So mm -hmm. nothing against you, Mayor. I'm just saying we've gone through that so many times when people have said this one person from 1954 said that <laughs> <laughs> do this thing, you know, and so I, not that I don't have faith, but I just I guess I don't understand the push to, um, you know, make a final cut. Yeah, me too. But that's everybody's opinion. That's why we all have different opinions up here. Yeah. Well, call for a vote. Okay. Um, this is a roll call vote. Council Member Blair. Aye. Council Member Chaburka? No. Council Member Graff? Aye. Council Member Heyer? No. Council Member Myers? Aye. Vice Chair White? No. Chair Ritchie? Aye. So that passes. Um, those that, that anybody would like to explain there, or I think we've already talked about this yeah. enough. I didn't I know where we feel, mm -hmm. but if anyone wants to say anything. I, I'll just, again, I applaud the administration for being willing to work with this developer. And, and um, I, 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 I just think we're putting a huge expectation on what UTA is going to bring us back. And, and I, I'd hate to see us keep putting it down the road, putting it on the road, and then and not ever get not get what we want back from them. So I, I, I applaud the administration for, for being willing to work with them um, and willing, being willing to, as was mentioned earlier, to maybe broaden the idea and, and bring in extra help and extra, extra expertise that, that really enhance this project and, and what that can be. So I, yeah, I, I feel the same way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, up next we have a report from uh, Planning Commission, Barton Brierley. Welcome back uh, to talk about the um, uh, proposed ordinance 2024-8. Okay, so this is a proposal to amend the zoning ordinance that would uh, prohibit paying brick in commercial zones in the East Central District. So just as background, the East Central District is a national historic district. It has a really great eclectic mix of uh, homes and businesses and other buildings. And if you, you drive through there, you just 
enjoy all the different architectural styles and, and buildings that have been preserved in that area. Uh, on the question about brick painting, uh, this is what the experts say. These are people who are in the business and why you shouldn't paint your brick. Uh, this is one company that says painting over brick is essentially a death sentence for brick because you're stripping it of its natural ability to breathe and release any moisture that becomes trapped. Another company that works in this field says, shows this. In this photo, you can see the paint failing and taking the face of the brick with it. This is called spalling and is irreversible. So the paint accelerates the deterioration of the brick. Uh, painting also alters the historic character of the whatever building you paint. In this case, they chose purple. Um, but here's some local examples of uh, buildings in the East Central that have been painted. You can see the, the color, the depth, the texture on the left, and then how that's lost when it's just painted. Here's another example of a building. You can see the, the color of the brick, the texture of the brick, the texture of the detailing, and again, all that's uh, just made uniform with painting over the brick. And I know the, the Planning Commission had done quite a bit of research on this, driven around the area, and felt that just every time a building gets painted, we lose something. We lose part of our history. So the current ordinance does prohibit painting brick in the East Central in the residential zones. Now, not everything in the East Central is a residential zone. There are little pockets of uh, other zones, like neighborhood commercial zones in that area. And the ordinance doesn't apply to those uh, zones. And so the Planning Commission uh, wanted to fill in that loophole in those areas. And, uh, and we have had some losses of uh, buildings. This is a commercial brick building in the East Central District, which uh, the owners wanted to paint. And we really had no ability to say no in there. So the proposal would fill in those gaps and prohibit brick painting in all the East Central zones. And the Planning Commission's recommended to that you adopt the, the ordinance. I'm happy to. Thank you, Barton. Any questions. Any questions for Barton? It's not a public hearing, but we've elected to receive public input. So if you'd like to come to address the council on this issue, please step to the podium and state your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Al Jones, Ogden City resident. I'm not a big fan of telling people what they can and can't do with their properties. However, in this particular case, I fully support. Uh, I own a big brick house, and my brick restorer said, the only thing that's keeping this house up is it's never been painted. Uh, and in addition to that, that uh, I own a building over on Lincoln, which uh, got tagged with graffiti, and the Ogden City anti-graffiti team came and managed to remove it in its entirety. I can't even see where the tag was. So I just don't see any reason why not. Big brick houses are beautiful and should stay that way. Thank you, Al. Hi, I'm Steve Jones, Ogden resident. Um, years ago, when I first moved to Ogden, my wife and I restored a property at 2555 Jefferson Avenue, uh, 10,000 square feet or, or more of, of building, and the brick had previously been painted. So I think uh, there needs to be some understanding that you know, some of these buildings might need to be grandfathered in uh, because the the situation we faced was, do we remove the paint that was previously put on there and what what is that gonna do to the building or do we repaint it and you know, hope for the best? And we made the decision to, to repaint it. So I think each building is gonna be a different situation, but there is a, you know, there are a number of buildings that just for whatever reason previously have been painted and you know, worst case, 
possible is that those buildings stop being maintained. So that's what I'm suggesting is, is that you take, it, take into consideration uh, things that might need to be grandfathered in and still maintained. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good evening, Teresa Bramwell. This is an issue I feel passionately about um, <clears throat> because I just paid $500 to the Planning Commission to have them discuss this about my property and come to find out I didn't even need to do it because it was allowed to begin with. This is the first I knew. One of them voted against me being able to do it when apparently it was already allowed and I paid $500 for them to almost tell me I couldn't do it, but they did tell me I could do it. So I will be painting my house. Um, and the reason why, not because I don't love red brick houses, because I purchased a red brick house. That's my favorite thing. I love a red brick house with white trim and a black roof. That's my happy place, which is what I told the planning commission. But when I have to, when I've had a fire and I have to rebuild my property and I'm adding, you know, I have to take the entire roof off because it has been damaged beyond repair, I want to improve my property, which means I'm going to add a second level. So in order to do that, they told me I had to do hardy board, which is a painted product. So how Frankenstein-y is a, a property going to look that has one color brick on the base level, painted hardy board on the second level? I mean, that, that's ridiculous. That's going to look stupid. And so many properties in Ogden are not very cute. And how many properties in Ogden that are in this commercial area are built out of cinder block? Are you telling people they can't paint cinder block? Because it would be so much cuter painted. And it would be so, so much more aesthetically pleasing. And neither is cinder block historic. So my commercial building is made out of cinder block. Only the very front of it is rock or glass. So I've got mostly glass, and then I've got one little six foot section of rock, and then the entire rest of the building is cinder block. Are you gonna tell me I can't paint cinder block? It's already painted. And you know, I live in Harvard Yale in Salt Lake, which is a very historic area. Yale Crest, very historic. In fact, it's on the national registry and the local registry of being historic. And so many homes and so many properties in that neighborhood have been painted. And they're so much better when they have been painted. Because the reason why somebody would paint something is because it's ugly. It's either been graffitied, it's built out of some, you know, terrible material like cinder block, or it just is ugly and doesn't match. So you're painting it to make it cohesive. And I think this, the, uh, pictures he used of properties that have been painted weren't very attractive because they were just all one color. Most people would paint the base of the property one color, do the shutters and the windows a different color, and it would be cute. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else like to address the council on this issue? Hi, Travis Pete. I think uh, I, with regards to this, it seems like we're straining at a gnat but swallowing a camel. Uh, as you know, I, I, a neighbor and myself have actually petitioned for historic preservation aspects in the, in, in the area and in the neighborhood, and yet we were denied uh, in the sense that there's not time, there's not resources, there's not the means to do so, to, to research this. And more particularly, there was no permission from any of the owners, and yet I had one of the owners was there, and two of the other owners had given permission, but it was a matter of whether it was a notarized or a petition form and permission from owners. There's been no petition, petition or permission from owners on this, and yet here it is presented. Just completely opposite of what was asked of me. And so another fellow resident, which I believe some of these staff members live in Ogden, some of the previous staff members have not. But here we're gonna rezone, we're gonna do all these other dynamics, and yet there's not any accountability or equal asks of what's done. So yes, we can have this, but we need permission from some of the owners. We can have this, but we need permission 
and or it should be turned down because I I was told at a work session that the reason mine was a non-starter is because I didn't have permissions from owners and yet I did and we talked about the mayor's hundred day plan the history culture artifacts protection of our history we talked about the water resource plans the block that I proposed for historic preservation is simply AG fell we have the artesian wells for this city and the water resources from because of Mayor H. E. Phil. Hiram H. Spencer, also a mayor. We have water resources. He built Echo Reservoir. He proposed Pine View Dam. And yet we are turning our complete backs on history and heritage for the people that supported the Union Station long before the railroad even got here. And so to me, it would be premature to vote for this without one permission from the owners which is what's been asked of me so turn it back to the commercial property owners and all those other owners <coughs> that are going to be affected by this to see if there's permissions first because that's what was asked of me or it's not equal protection under the law and the and the, the same dynamic is just it, it really feels that there's been some adversarial aspects we even said would come to the city council my neighbor and i and say let's create a plan that's not as stringent as landmarks commission but still protects demolition you can demolish either any of these buildings right now but you can't paint them mm -hmm. if this passes strange tear it down but don't paint it tear it down but don't paint it thank you any other comments Good evening, Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I live in an almost 100 year old brick house with a black roof and our trim is black, it's not white and it's got a little pointy roof and it's, it's adorable. And one of the things that I fell in love with Ogden is its character and those historic buildings. I'm a sucker for historic buildings. So what I'm about to say may seem a little contradictory. Um, we're a property rights state, but then I also agree that we have to have certain zones that are protected. I think the biggest objection that I personally have to what this code is, is that it may only be painted the existing color. And uh, Ms. Bramwell brought up a really great example of when you make an addition to a house that it's cohesive. So I think we would benefit by having some more discussion on this, perhaps leaning into Mayor Nadolsky's uh, conversations that he's going to have to be able to engage the community so that there's an awareness rollout that this is gonna be happening. How do you feel about it? And um, there are some cases when you're talking about paint that is specifically for brick, not masonry paint like you would put on a cinder block wall, but but paint that is designed specifically to preserve brick, protect brick. And there are instances, and my house is one of them, where the brick is degrading and sealing that brick with an appropriate clear color or an actual color preserves the brick and allows it to last longer. And I understand we dance back and forth between does anybody really want to live next to a flamingo pink house? Probably not, but, but this is America and we do have rights and we do have property rights. So maybe if we just, rather than all or nothing, move to a discussion and involve the community in an appropriate color palette. Um, and then of course the enforcement portion of it, when people go and get the paint, we want to make sure that they actually have the appropriate paint before they start. And it comes back to, um, you know, our code enforcement department is really amenable. They're really nice people. And um, if we help set them up for success by here's the process, here's how you do it, here's the products that you could use and the, make an appointment, they'll come by, they'll check the thing, give you a box and off you go. Um, I just think we, we, we have an opportunity for engagement and I think property rights are important and I also believe that we should talk about this a little more. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? I'm going to smaller. Okay, my name is Sebastian Benitez. When I moved here in the United States 24 years ago, 
I bring my family here to raise in the freedom, you know, and I, I bought my first house on 32nd Street in Harrison. And I think I own the house, you know, and I can remodel, I can do whatever I want. But the freedom is not there. Now I live in different other place, you know, but I think, the point is, I think when we buy the house, we like to make upgrade and the paint color is some, sometimes cut my freedom. I disappoint this, but I, dis, I, uh, I am happy for different other things I am talking later. But at this point, I think we can, we can prohibit the, the people on the house what color they have to do it. That is not our, it's not the government decision in my understanding, you know? Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Any other comments? Barnett, I think there were a couple questions. Um, if we can have you come back up. So a, a home that's already been painted, or in this case, the business, because this is already, uh, this is what we're talking about. Are the, is there a grandfather type of situation if someone needs to repaint? Yeah, the uh, ordinance doesn't uh, prohibit painting over paint. Over paint, okay. And what about cinder block? Doesn't prohibit painting cinder block, just brick. Okay. Any other questions or I comments? I have a quick or, question because yeah. I'm worried about Teresa because I think her property is probably in these mm -hmm. this area. So she just paid five hundred dollars to get it approved, and today we approved this ordinance, and she won't be able to paint, right? So the, the no. one question would be if is it a residential property? Well, it's the one she's told us about about a hundred times, the one that's yeah. on the N one zone. So I'm guessing oh, it's it, yes, yeah, that one right yeah. there. Oh yeah, Good and point. that was approved by the planning commission because it was fire damaged. That, so that then it was if we pass this ordinance today, it won't impact her. That's correct. Okay. She can <laughs> still do that, right? Yeah. That just seems That's good. That's good, good catch. Yes. Good catch. And the ordinance does allow in extreme circumstances for, for someone to go to, to the planning commission and say, hey, Pretty there's cool. no oh, other way to, to do it. So there is that out. Well, I just wanted to clarify, too, because I think um, to Travis's point, we're just talking about filling in these holes of where all of East Central now has this policy for the residential areas. Correct. It's just um, the commercial areas that we're talking about or all those other zones. But I do, I do, um, I like this idea of furthering the conversation, whatever happens um, this evening, because I think it is a case that there is some challenges, and we talked a little bit about this in the work session, that you don't have to get a permit to paint your house, right? Correct. From my, remem you know, from remembering that. So I think that is part of the issue is that People will be in the neighborhood at this point, whatever the ordinance might be, they see one house the same age as the one right next to it, and one is painted and one is not. And so if you're just a regular citizen, you don't have to get a permit to paint your house, so you're just going to say, hey, I want to fix up my house, let me just do it. And you don't get stopped until either you're started in the middle or it's already done, and then people are getting code violated and in trouble. So I feel like maybe there is some other thing that we need to work on besides this one particular issue, but I don't know if other people agree with that too. If we're yeah, going to improve I, it, I if we're going to have that. it in place, I, yeah. then we need to help pr prepare people so they know what they can and can't do. Mm -hmm. Chair, I have a question for Barton. You said that it, that Cinder Block is not, no. No. it is allowed to be painted? Yes. I'm looking at the ordinance and I don't think it makes a distinction unless oh. it does somewhere else. Unless it, it defines block as different than brick somewhere. Mm. Is that is that what what happens or? Yeah. Is it not? It, maybe it just doesn't reference cinder block. It, it doesn't. It, it doesn't says, talk about cinder block. It says brick. brick. Yeah. And that that may you know if cinder block isn't isn't brick then okay I guess yeah. I understand. <laughs> Still confusing. Yeah, yeah that's a, a not it's. It's a different material. It's often that you have the a cinder block base and brick above it, and that cinder block yeah. base can be paint, painted, but the brick not. So, and so, cinder block has different characteristics than the brick. So, does cinder block affect differently to paint than regular brick does? Yes. Yeah. Um, 
you know, brick is, it's made out of different materials. It's, you know, mm -hmm. typically a clay and it's more susceptible to deterioration than okay. cinder block. Cinder block's a, a newer material and more durable and it still can deteriorate, but it just has different okay. right. characteristics. So, so brick is different than block. And yes. that's why this ordinance doesn't apply to that. Correct. Okay, great. Thanks. That was my question. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? No. Any any motion on this item? Or, or Before discussion. making motion, Further discussion. I'll, Sorry. Yeah. I'll say a few things because yes. I think we know how I feel about this, <laughs> and then you guys can all vote your way. Um, I appreciate Teresa and um, Angel making their comments. Um, I agree. I think I just jotted down some things, and and yeah, I. Everybody wants to have a home that reflects who they are, right? It, it tells who they are, and 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 you you learn people you learn about people by the the, the appearance of, of their home, and I and I think this is just one other way that allows people to to do that. Um, I'm all for I'm all for having a, a certain palette that that is approved. Um, I'm all for requiring that they do the two tone or different tone. I. Um, Again, I, I, I'm not up here. I'm not a house painting expert, but I do like I, I the one the one example we showed of the tan house. I thought looked great. I honestly do not see a problem with it. That's just me. Um, however, the all gray house, the all gray business from gray from the pavement to the top, I agreed. I don't think anybody liked the look of that or or wants that to be prevalent. So I. I, 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 if it were me, I would make some changes that I don't like the, the base, whether it's cement or cinder block or whatever it is to be painted or it should be, um, but I, I, um, I, I do like, I do like the idea of having more discussion and, and, and providing an opportunity or an avenue for those people that want to do that. Um, we talk about people loving Ogden and wanting to move into Ogden and, 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 and why people choose to live here in Ogden. And for me, this is one of those reasons. People come here because there's a great character and because they can move here and get a, a home with character in a great neighborhood that doesn't look like every other house in some of our surrounding communities. You can come here and get a home that I think helps tell people who you are. And I, I, I believe people want to move here and people want to start something and have something nice and have something great. And to me, this allows them to do that. So I, I, I voted against it when we talked about doing it for houses. I vote, I'll vote against it tonight because I just don't agree, I don't agree with it. Um, I think we can find ways to make it work for people we we want to we want to be open and and collaborate and I just think there's ways to do that with this also um, and like I said there's but yeah I would appreciate more more discussion or an opportunity to to maybe explore what other communities who are older I I don't really care what newer communities are doing they don't have to paint they don't have they don't have hundred year houses but. I would I would be interested to know what other communities are doing because like I said there is an appetite for it that um, and I, I made the example there's two houses on my street that look completely refreshed and, and completely nice and completely they pop now and and that pop doesn't just pop for their house it pops for my whole block so I appreciate what they did um, yeah had they painted it bright pink from cement to roof maybe I'd have a different opinion but they didn't um, because I, like I said I think everybody wants to have a nice home and, and sure. if this provides an opportunity I'm, I'm for it thank you sure I'd love that to just read this little part for, mm -hmm. for uh, council member Blair I, I don't disagree with what you said I, I I'm sympathetic <laughs> you know but in the in the ordinance um, so painting or sealing of unpainted brick may be approved by the Planning Commission if an evaluation is submitted to the Planning Commission that has been reviewed by the director providing that or providing information that 
and they give three things. One of them is the paint or sealant used will preserve the brick. Uh, paint or sealing of the brick is required to provide a protective surface or surface that will limit the continued or limit the continued erosion of the brick. And the color of the paint will match the existing brick color. I mean, I I, I think those first two, I mean, A and B mm -hmm. of this ordinance probably coincide with what you're saying. You'd, yeah. you'd like people to be able to do something if they want to. Yeah. Does, does this alleviate that, that concern at all for you? Well, it would have to be the color of the brick. The, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm, like I said, but, yeah. I, I would still like us to be able to have an opportunity to sit down and come up with um, discussions um, or opportunities. I appreciate that being in here. Um, but yeah, I, I and I, like I said, and my one of my I'm, my main concern tonight is because I, I voted against it in the past, yeah. and so just to be consistent. Yeah. Well, without this ordinance, we don't we can't work through those things. That's that's kind of what I'm thinking. But if if you know, I I think if you took off uh, that two uh, C, the color of the paint or sealant will match the existing brick color. Maybe that solves your your yeah. issues. And uh, I, this is where I, I'm, I'm kind of betwixt and between on this one too. I, I'm a property rights guy. I think people have to be mm -hmm. able to do what they want. Um, I have seen painted brick that is okay. It's pretty nice. Yep. Um, but one thing uh, that staff has pretty well convinced me of is once you paint it, it's painted. It's not going to not be painted yep. ever again. And so there's no going back. So you'd hope mm -hmm. people would would be would go forward with not half cocked, you know. Mm -hmm. They they'd have thought this thing through and got it, and talked to people that are smart and yeah. got the right kind of paint and you know some of those exactly. Things. And, and and I think without this, they they won't get to that point. Well, I don't want to belabor the discussion, <laughs> but I'm just curious. I mean, what? Um, I guess what is the reason why you don't need a permit to paint your house, but other kinds of things you do need a permit? I don't know. <laughs> I don't have an answer. I, don't, I mean, I agree I, with that. I yeah. guess I agree with I that. I mean, yeah. maybe that's mm -hmm. part of the issue that we're talking about. And not necessarily that you have to dictate everything about it, but maybe when you inform people about yeah. the damage it does, etc. I don't know. As I have complex too, because I certainly believe in historic preservation. And my house was never painted. I'm so lucky um, because my neighbor's house is the twin has been painted, and they just cannot figure out how to get because our bricks are basically just blowing away in the wind, right? Mm -hmm. Mine's been sealed. But um, so I think I have similar feelings that I want people to be able to do what they'd like with their property, but I know the damage that can occur, especially to historic buildings. So I think whether it's a date. You know, um, maybe that's better than a whole area that we're saying, or some other parameters might be better yeah. too. That's a good idea. I'm open for more conversations. <laughs> Any other discussion? So, sounds like Talk maybe tabling might be the better option here. <laughs> I was just joking that we should extend it, so yeah. there you go. <laughs> but what we're talking about. It is not just resident. I mean, we're right. we're, we're only trying. talking about I know commercial yeah. here. We're not, mm -hmm. so we would have to you know review the rest of the residential ordinance as well. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's the issue. Yeah, I, I think if we're going to discuss yeah, it, we've right. got to discuss yeah. right. Good point. the whole all the, of it. The whole yeah. I, I kind of I, I feel like the same way. I feel like this is, you know, I I feel okay with this ordinance. I do, uh, but I do think that we need to do more with it yeah. in terms of. What Council Member Traberka was talking about. So, does anybody know? Has there been an uproar in the East Central neighborhood after the passage of the residential brick painting ban? There's not an uproar, but every day probably there's someone that's painting their brick that someone's telling me about. Then I have to say, hey, <laughs> tell code enforcement. I mean, almost every day in the summer. I don't know if there's a code enforcement person here, but practically in East Central, I would say there's a lot of people trying to paint, paint their brick. Getting in trouble. We had some but people in front of us too. But redoing the ordinance won't <laughs> prevent that. They'll still do it, right? If, but if we make some other process where they would have to get a permit first yeah. before you paint your house, then we could have some. <coughs> then you could have parameters, right? Mm -hmm. That they know about up front. 
I, I wonder if we could just amend this ordinance to delete 2C. That's that's matching the brick color with the paint. You know what I mean? So that if if people did want to paint a different color, they still have to get approved, but it doesn't have to match the brick. Yeah. And you're just that, talking commercial? Huh? I'm just talking commercial. I know we're just talking commercial. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It might help me uh, vote for this. As a, as so, as Barton, a, is that that's a question on that two C? Is that when somebody comes for an exception? Oh, is there any latitude on the planning commission granting painting other than the same color? Well, the ordinance is written that, that it would, would it'd have to. The only so, thing would be the same color. Yes. So, so and, okay. That so, answers that. Yeah. yes, you'd have to amend that ordinance to do. Barton, that. does that also match the previous ordinance for residential homes in the yes. same area? Yes. <clears throat> this is the same. All right. We have a motion, or what are we doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's never good to change an ordinance on the fly. It's true. Or at least so I've been told. <laughs> so I think it would be a benefit to either extend or table. If that's what you want to do. Calendar's coming out. <laughs> making a motion? <laughs> Do we have, yeah, anybody else want a motion to extend or table or, or motion to approve? Jimmy's looking or? at a calendar to see what, what date might work. <laughs> Go ahead, so Janine. It depends on what you want to do. I mean, we next month we're pretty much full for... Uh, the Just April, forward. May and June are budget, but we can still work it in if you want to try it. We can go later than that. Get it after budget. So. Hmm. I mean, Just, I definitely, oh, sorry. I apologize. Sorry. <laughs> I was just going to say, I'd be happy to help host or facilitate some conversations with community members about this. I mean, since it is sort of in the neighborhood. Um, but yeah, whatever works best, we could um, vote and either approve or deny this. I think the challenge for this this particular one is, is that all we're trying to do is match it with the surrounding ordinance. Yeah. So I don't know if it's this particular piece that we hold up or that we also just commit to exploring the whole the issue Central. further. Yeah. So that's, you know, I'm happy with either way because I don't know if this particular ordinance is the problem. Yeah. I think that people want to open up the conversation about the entire conversation about the entire issue. I agree with that. That's so then, pa pass this and and review the entire ordinance, regardless of zoning. Or or the vice versa, zone, or deny yeah. this, and either way, just will take a while for it to happen. Mr. Chair, yes, I just want to commend the the planners that this is. I think it's this is a prudent idea. I think it matches our central district, and I would like to make a motion that we go ahead and approve the proposed amendment prohibiting painting. Or covering of exterior brick in commercial or multi-family zones in the East Central District. We have a motion. Any second. We have a second by. We have a motion by Council Member Myers and a second by Vice Chair White to approve uh, proposed ordinance 2024-8. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Chaburka. No. Council Member Graff. Aye. Council Member Hire. I, if we can revisit the whole thing. <laughs> I'm getting a little that's a that's that's a council initiative option opportunity for sure. Yeah, Rich so, and I will do yeah. one together. Okay. okay. Council member Myers. Aye. Council member Blair. No. Vice Chair White. Aye. Chair Ritchie. Aye. That passes. Mm -hmm. And I think we've had enough discussion on yeah. that. I don't, I don't so. need to <laughs> Thank you. Moving on to reports from administration, <laughs> we have Lorenzo. I think he's here in person. I was to, I was told he might be joining us via Zoom. So welcome, oh Lorenzo, goodness. our sustainability coordinator, to come and talk to us about the proposed amendments to the Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee Ordinance. That's a mouthful. Thank you very much, Lorenzo Long, Sustainability Coordinator, um, here on behalf of the Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee. I uh, just want to talk about a couple of proposed ordinance amendments for the committee. I'm assuming this will let me go next. It will. 
Okay, so I just wanted to give a very brief background and a review just of what the committee does. So some of their duties and powers. Um, educational programs, they can talk about um, many things and they're not limited to these things, but things such as waste reduction and recycling, air quality, power and water conservation, et cetera and so forth. Um, they can also, uh, at the request of the council or the mayor, recommend or evaluate policies that have to do with um, what their duties and powers are in their, in their scope. Um, they can also look at grants or state and federal programs for the city to apply for, for funding or things of that nature. And they also serve, again, in an advisory capacity to the council and the mayor for anything that the council or the mayor would like them to look into and evaluate. So they are an important resource for uh, the city and for the council and the mayor. Our current committee membership, just have a little chart here. Um, the green boxes mean it's filled and the red is not filled. So as you can see, we've got one spot for the education or business community, which is filled someone, by someone who lives in district three. And then we've got someone from district one. That's a spot that's dedicated to district one as are the district two, three and four spots. It can only be someone who lives in those districts. Um, so of those we're missing district two, but the others are filled. And then we have four at large spots um, of which two are filled um, with members from district three. And then we've got three spots open for high school students who go to Ogden high schools. And uh, none of those are filled now, though I am going to Ogden High School tomorrow to speak to some students. So what are we proposing? What is the committee requested? Um, one is to allow qualified non-resident experts to join the Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. <laughs> the second is to change the text uh, in the ordinance to reflect that city sustainability staff now leads the committee um, as opposed to the public services director. And then number three, to change the name of the committee to the sustainability committee, <laughs> which we will talk about. Okay, so why change membership requirements? It's pretty simple. The sustainability committee uh, would like to have um, additional expertise. And so this just basically allows the committee to access a larger applicant pool of people that are qualified experts in sustainability. And I'd also, um, with this change, would still allow the committee to maintain an Ogden city resident majority. And the reason for that is because the allotted spots there that would be open to non-residents are less than the number of other spots that are specifically allocated to certain areas of the city. Um, and as you can see, we've already filled two of those at-large spots, so there's two open right now, but as those open up in the future, um, under this proposed changes, those could be those who live outside of Ogden City. And those, a lot of those people that you know want to be a part of the committee are people who spend a lot of their time here. They work here, or they go to church here, or they play sports here, or whatever. They feel like an Ogden resident, but they might just live right across the street from where that border is, right? So they feel like a resident, but they're not. Um, but they have an expertise that the committee could really use. Um, so that's why the committee has requested that change. Why change the name? Um, just try saying it 10 times fast. It's very long. <laughs> um, yeah, it's tough. So when we're out there, you know, as a committee and we're tabling and people are saying, oh, well, who, do, who do you guys represent? You know, it's, it's, we're the Ogden City Natural Resources and Sustainability Stewardship Committee. And they're like, oh, what? What was that? You know? Uh, so just simply, we want to shorten it to the Sustainability Committee because it still encompasses the scope and vision of the committee while being much easier to communicate with the public. Um, pretty simple. Um, and I just wanted to put a little uh, QR code there for anyone who's watching or in the future that wants to apply for the committee. We're always looking for residents. You can find an application there. It's also on our website. Um, and you can find it there. And that's all I had to say. So any questions or comments? Terrific. Thank you, Lorenzo. Any comments, question, uh, discussion? Just real quick. So um, I, I'm, I, I'll be, I'm the one to blame for the long name, just so you know. <laughs> and, and it was my ignorance to think that uh, natural resources weren't uh, sustainable. So I, I appreciate that. Uh, you have been able to shorten it because I, I always call it the Sustainability Committee anyway, so <laughs> Same. thank you. <laughs> All right. Great. Yeah, 
Um, I just really appreciate Lorenzo's service. He's um, been doing a lot of stuff on the Community Renewable Energy Agency Board. When I can't be there, he helps represent us and has done a lot of great outreach and work on that committee. So I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I just wanted to ask one question just to make sure I understood that correctly. Just like us, we have, we have the four at-large seats. Or, I mean, sorry, three at-large seats. Four. Four, yeah. four at-large seats. And then a business and four. Okay. But if someone lives outside the, the district, if someone lives outside of the city, they would fill the at-large seat, not a district seat. That's correct. Perfect. Okay. Just want to make sure. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So well, why not off before I could? So <laughs> it is district two. I'll just leave it up there, you know, as, in case anyone's interested. Chair, sure. I'd be happy to make an motion Thank to you. adopt the ordinance. We're done discussing. I'll second it. We have a motion by Councilmember Chaburka, a second by Councilmember Myers to adopt proposed ordinance 2024-9. This is a roll call vote. Councilmember Graff. Aye. Councilmember Heyer? Aye. Councilmember Myers? Aye. Councilmember Blair? Aye. Councilmember Chaburka? Aye. Vice Chair White? Aye. Chair Ritchie? Aye. That passes. There we go. I'm sorry, I had to laugh at the, the closed captioning that says for it was Jim Burka. Oh, <laughs> Call me what you like. Councilmember Jim Burka. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. We have um, we have next on the agenda the appointment of Community and Economic Development Director. Um, we had a presentation on this last week. I don't know if um, we need or want. Do we need to? Would you like to make a quick comment and then we can accept public input and then we can. I, I can follow your lead. I think. Yeah. I think Jared's prepared to share a few comments if you will. Um, but whatever order you want, we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll help. Any preference? I think let's go ahead just with some public input on this. Those that are here to address the council on the um, appointment of Jared Johnson for the Community Economic De Development Director, uh, go ahead and come to the podium and state your name and limit your comments to three minutes. Al Jones, Ogden City resident. Uh, I've had a chance to <clears throat> chat with Jared on numerous occasions and I personally find him to be uh, a person who listens and uh, is non-argumentative uh, and so I would support his approval. Thank you. Uh, thank Welcome. you all for the opportunity to be here. Uh, my name is Aaron Osted. Um, I'm with the Boyer Company at Business Depot Ogden. Um, had the opportunity to work with Jared for, for many years, as well as many of you and many of the 668 employees, I think was mentioned, um, at Ogden City. Uh, it's been a real honor, actually, to, to work with all of you and work with this amazing city. Um, I think you could say we've been a huge part of the economic development of Ogden City. Um, over the past 20 years at Business Depot Ogden. Um, and something that we tout all the time when we have businesses come in to, the, to, uh, to look at property in Ogden and at, in particular BDO is the competitive advantage that we have to be able to work with the city and to get things approved quickly, to get things approved efficiently, um, and, and to really get things, uh, projects done at a timely manner. If you looked at a lot of projects uh, through the years, if you were to look at other developers, at times, that could take a year and a half to get a project out of the ground where really we've been able to build and get buildings and, and employees and companies in within eight to ten months, which is phenomenal. That is only due to employees in Ogden City. It really is. Um, that is a huge competitive advantage that we have, and one of those employees is Jared Johnson, without a doubt. Jared personally has helped us through the years to get um, large businesses in when there were hurdles uh, between departments. I don't think it's any kind of a secret that sometimes departments butt heads. Uh, Jared has been extremely efficient at uh, bringing departments together and making sure that everybody's on the same page and that they're able to, to get together and come to a conclusion to help Ogden grow, um, and that's been huge. The other thing I'd say is I've, I've worked with CED for many, many years. I've been with Boyer for 18 years. 
Um, so I've seen CED and how that works. Um, I would say that, that um, sometimes there's the yes man mentality, that it's yes, 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 we can get that done. Oh yeah, absolutely, we'll get it done. When in reality, without consulting departments within the city, that can cause some serious problems. And it has caused some serious problems in the past. What I love about Jared Johnson is he's not the yes man. Jared is, I don't know, let me find out. And then he gets the departments involved to make sure that he can get back to the company and, and give them the right, the right answer to that. He's the yes man in the essence that he comes back and finds the best answer to the solution, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's making empty promises that can't be fulfilled. So that is my endorsement of Jared Johnson. Um, he's been phenomenal to work with, and I think he'd be a phenomenal uh, CED director. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Good evening, Council. Uh, Mitch Vance with Jay Fisher Companies. Uh, we are a partner to with the city on several projects, Wonder Block, Union Station. I'm here representing Jay Fisher. It, uh, Chad Bessinger fully intended on being here tonight until he realized it was his wife's birthday. <laughs> and I think they're, they're at a restaurant somewhere in Ogden. This is where he goes now for, for those kind of occasions. So just imagine me as a big buff bearded man and, and it'll all work out. Um, what, what I would say is, is you on the council, mayor as well, have, have worked over the years and you uh, established the Make Ogden Plan to ensure the economic, financial, visual health of the downtown core of, of Ogden City. It was a pro proactive approach that the city took that attracted a lot of private sector interest. Um, this position that, that you're filling is, is someone who will carry out that plan, uh, which is an important position for you as a council. Uh, you need someone who's been around, who knows it, who knows the city, who knows what needs to be done to carry out that plan. And, and for us, Jared is someone who can execute. Uh, so we fully support his, appoint his appointment. He's capable, he's knowledgeable, he's understanding. Uh, he's genuine. Um, his, the team that he's, that he's established, that we've been working with, has been great to work with. They've stepped into the role in, on projects that are, are complex. The relationship and the contracts that we have with all of you are very complex. You all know that. And they've, they've caught up quickly, and they've done a great job of, of making sure they understand those. Um, and for us, most importantly, I, I think they're very solution-oriented. Uh, thus far, Jared and his team have ardently defended the city's interests in all the things, that, in all the contracts, and all the um, efforts we've we've led with them. But they're also willing to find solutions to any problems that that come up. And that that's the type of person that we and you need carrying out the um, the Make Ogden plan. So we're excited to support the prospect of him continuing working with him and his team, and we would encourage you to make that appointment as well as give him all the support he needs to continue doing good work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Good evening, Sarah Tolliver with Visit Ogden. I too just wanted to express my support of the appointment of Jared Johnson. When Jared stepped into the deputy director position, we sat in a meeting together and looked at each other like, who are you? We didn't know <laughs> who each other was. And it's quickly become a, uh, I think, very mutually respected relationship. And I really appreciated the collaboration and opportunities bringing me to the table um, when things impacted the visitor economy as well as our residents. And just really appreciate that willingness for collaboration and as we work on mutual projects such as you know continuing to work on the vibrancy of our downtown as well as the rest of our community and working towards that future vision and strategy that will lead us to the next version of our best selves and the community we all want to live in and play in so thank you thank you Sarah any other comments Hi, uh, Teresa Bramwell again. I feel like I'm taking up all the time, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, Jared will be in charge of the uh, code enforcement department. So I have a story about court code enforcement uh, because I think that's going to be his very biggest job. If you think it's making the city look pretty, uh-uh. It's about code enforcement. You're going to spend all your time there. Um, so this was an experience I had with the code enforcement department in Ogden City. So how many people have been to the antique shops in Cedar City? OK, 
Can you picture what I'm talking about? Have you ever been down to the Utah Shakespearean Festival and visited all the antique shops in Cedar City? Well, I love to do that because for a while I was really big into antiques. And so I went into the antique shop one day looking for a, a stool that was made out of a milk can that had a tractor seat. And I found it because the lady had it. But she also had these really cool uh, antique uh, wagon wheels. And I was like, oh, those are awesome. I need those. I'm going to make those into a trellis for my front yard. So I brought them back to Ogden, and I put one on each side of my big stairway going up to my house in the flower beds that I had there. One antique wagon wheel here, the other one there. So I did that when I was living in the house. And when I moved out, I put a tenant in the house. And I came to collect the rent one day, and, and the wagon wheels were gone. And I said to the tenant, what, what happened to my wagon wheels? And he said, oh, I have no idea. I, I didn't do anything with them. They just were gone one day, and a whole bunch of my stuff was gone too. Maybe somebody came and stole them. So I think I made a police report about my stolen wagon wheels. Don't remember exactly because it was a long time ago. So a couple years go by and I go to pay my property taxes. And on my property taxes, there's a bill from Ogden City Code Enforcement for 850 bucks. And I said to the, uh, the, the person that was taking my money, I said, what's this for? They said, we have no idea. You'll have to go talk to the Code Enforcement Department because they're the ones that sent us the bill. So I go into the code enforcement department. I'm like, what is this $850 bill for you put on my property taxes? And they go back and look in their files and they're like, oh, well, we, we, we cleared the debris off of your property and you were notified so many times about it and you never responded. And I was like, oh, well, those are my antique wagon wheels that I bought in Cedar City from the antique shop. And you are charging me $850 to throw them away? That doesn't make any sense. Well, come to find out, they'd sent all the notices to Topper Bakery. Next door, the next door neighbor had received all the notices for these being a problem. And they originally put the bill on Topper Bakery's uh, taxes. And only after Topper Bakery complained did the bill end up with me. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. <laughs> Justin Anderson, Ogden City Public Services. I just wanted to take a moment to talk about Jared Johnson. Having worked with him for, I want to say it's about eight years now, what you are getting with Jared. You're getting somebody with a high moral character. You're also getting somebody who is, I feel, very compassionate in into the citizens of Ogden. Um, but what is most impressive to me is how incredibly intelligent he is in these areas of being a leader, in working with businesses, in working with developers, to be able to come together and figure out how to actually make things happen. So I highly recommend his approval. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Um, just to want to remind those online, if you'd like to raise your hand to comment, you can do that. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Steve Jones, Ogden resident. Um, I have to admit, I don't know Jared Johnson. I just shook his hand last week for the first time. Um, but what I'd like to say is that you know, last week and this week, I've just heard testimonial after testimonial about his qualifications, about his personality, about his dedication to, to Ogden and so forth. It really sounds to me like he is the right person in the right place at the right time. And I encourage you to vote yes to put him into this, this position. Um, we just heard the mayor's 100 day plan. A lot has happened in these 100 days. Let's keep that momentum moving. Let's put, put Jared into this position so that he can continue that momentum and make us all more successful. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Any other comments? Zach Judkins, I'm also a resident of Ogden City. I talked to Jared, he likes wagon wheels, so I think we're good. Um, no, really, I'm, I'm just a contractor, but um, for us, it's 
you know, construction jobs can be difficult. Um, they're difficult to design, they're difficult to develop, they're difficult to get started. Um, and what most people don't understand is they're more difficult once we actually start construction. And so I think it's important that as a contractor that we're dealing with people that um, are capable. And I think Jared is capable of making good decisions. Um, he's fair, he's fair for contractors, he's fair for developers, he's fair for owners, but he also has Ogden City in the best, uh, what's best for Ogden City at mind. And so, um, yeah, I, I would love to, uh, you know, motion that, that Jared gets uh, a yay. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Zach. Uh, Thomas Kiernan, Ogden City resident and Ogden Downtown Alliance. Um, I would like to um, encourage you to vote for the appointment of Jared. Um, we've had a handful of conversations. I believe that he's the right person to help support small business um, downtown and the community at large. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Chair, Council Members. My name is Cody Lyde. I'm the Building Services Supervisor and proud Ogden City resident. Um, I won't take up too much of your time, but I would be remiss if I didn't come up here and you know talk about my experience working under the leadership of Jared Johnson. Um, amazing man, amazing person in general. Uh, really leads by example. Uh, you know, honesty, integrity, truly truly has seen our department, our division, and myself personally through some really hard times over the past few years. Um, you know, I, I care about this city more than, than I could probably say in a couple minutes. Um, so I don't take it lightly saying that Jared Johnson is the right person for the job. And I hope you guys make that choice tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. All right, Travis Pate, I had the opportunity to visit with Mr. Johnson at the uh, Union Station open house for actually an extended period, which I felt was kind of probably more of my own frustrations and angst on, on certain things. And he was, he was very amenable in the sense that uh, to take time away, it, wasn't, it was, it was kind of in between uh, downtime at the meeting. Um, but the, the kindness that he showed uh, was, was pretty effective. And I think as we see uh, with, uh, with previous, there's possibly a quite significant damage control, but we're probably <laughs> painting that down a little bit because it, we need to. We need to focus on the good and the great that's happening. And I think this is a good and great. Uh, I think the dynamic with regards to uh, understanding each little department and each little division that he, for, for which he will have responsibility is pretty remarkable. And I, and I think as I've, as I've seen from the mayor's present, presentation and his plan, um, that we have someone here that the mayor simply orchestrated and then can stand out and have another maestro such as Mara and such as Jared and such as Justin and such as, I mean, the most amazing thing to me is the team where, with, with very few fine tuning that might need to happen or possibly just even professional courtesies that need to be extended for those individuals to get their master's degree online or whatever else that they too can step in. So I, I, I even Mr. Brierly, we've gone head to head on things. I think the dynamic that I see with the orchestrations that he has is that even Mr. Brierly can, so to speak, sit in that chair if it, the pecking order got down to that point. And I think that's the remarkable thing that I see with, with, this, with this appointment is that each, each individual that should need to sit in the opposite chair when when conditions happen, whether it be a baseball game and a family activity, I think that's phenomenal. The Mayor C car opportunity, um, we're going to restructure this because I'm a at home dad right now and mom's away and I need to be somewhere else. That was phenomenal for a mayor to stand up for his family and then say, but still stood up for his community. And I think that's the same thing that I see with, with this orchestration. And like I said, even though I've seen, like I said, there's been head to heads on a couple, couple different things, I see a, a great uh, conductor and the potential to, to just hand the baton for, for that. Yes, there may have been several things that are, have been out of tune in the past, but drums can be re, re and and punctures can be fixed. 
and brass that has been run over can be reinflated and, and refigured. <laughs> and the most amazing thing with brass is the only way to get that bend is to actually freeze it with ice and then get that bend because otherwise there's a horrible crease. And I see that there's not been a horrible crease with the transition, if, particularly if he's appointed into this position. Thank you. Interesting. Thank you, Travis. Any other comments? Okay, before we take uh, public or action on this, I um, just wanted to give the opportunity for council members to share their feelings or th their thoughts or, or, or if they have questions or, or whatever. I don't know if we want to start on one end or just rat as, as you go ahead, Council I, Member Hyde. I'd be happy to. Uh, I, I had a very high opinion of Jared before I ever met him um, because of the people that I had such great respect for that did know him and uh, came and made recommendations of him kind of out of the blue. I mean, it was, he was, uh, he was recognized by many of our city staff as kind of the rising star, a, a, a guy that had the, the character and the integrity that is going to be something in Ogden. And uh, there were several that, 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 were on city staff or are on city staff that uh, that told me just on one-on-one -on -one how great of a person and what kind of character Jared Johnson had. <laughs> and uh, since that time, you know, when we've been accepting uh, public input and um, you know the 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 who's who of the, of all y'all that have uh, came and said who you know who you have discovered Jared Johnson to be. Aaron Ostad from BDO, one of our big partners, uh, uh, JF Capital, um, and I can't name you all, but it's Sarah Tolliver. I mean, just just people that I have a lot of respect for that, that know him and have worked with him and have nothing but good to say about him has just reinforced the things that, that I learned before I ever, I couldn't have picked him out of a lineup because I'd never seen him, but uh, um, I, I feel very comfortable. Uh, I did have a couple of times to, to talk with him, and, and, I, and I really like the idea of his approach to um, visioning, which is more of a collaboration than a, this is my idea, you all, do, you all go do that. That I don't think it flies very well. I think his approach to, hey, let's get some smart people and let's talk about this thing and ha hammer it out until we come up with the best idea that we can. I love that approach and I'm looking forward to, to seeing those kind of uh, presentations come to us as council members um, after it's been vetted by, by a room full of really smart people. And so that's, that's the, I'm, I'm really excited to, to see him come on board in this position. Thank you, Chair. I also want to speak on behalf of Jared and just say that you look really good in a suit, Jared. I think that's the first time I've seen you. You could, uh, yeah. Uh, I think you hire the best person for the job. I think you hire a person with the ABCs, the attitude, the behavior, the character. I think we have all that. I love the fact that we hire from within because it gives hope, builds morale within our city, and it allows others to feel like they have a place to go to advance, to achieve, to grow and their jobs. I think uh, Jared's a great example of that. He's come through the ranks and developed and shown all of us, proven himself to be here. I commend you, Mayor, for your appointment and how you support it as well. Thank you. <clears throat> On this end? Sure. I, I get the last word, so. <laughs> so. Yeah. Sure, I'll go. Um, before I start, I just, I, you know, I've spent a great deal of time um, thinking about this appointment and making sure that, uh, that this is the right thing. And I, I, I just want to, I have some notes, so I apologize if I'm looking at my notes. But I do want to extend my uh, ser sincere gratitude for the people that have come up and, and, and spoken about Jarrett and, and Jared Johnson and, and the, the, the words that have resonated with me are, Things like the, the qualities that we want to, to espouse to, honesty, integrity, collaboration. And, and those are things that um, people have said over and over and over again about Jared. And I, I think that that's, that's pretty admirable. Um, 
As we approach this pivotal decision, it's really important for me to get to share my perspective. And I, I just want to say that these thoughts are not a reflection of Jared, but rather more of my personal viewpoint about this overall position. And um, I, 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 I highly have valued the input that I've received um, and, and have reached out to, to many of you because I believe it's essential to understand where I'm coming from before we all cast our votes. Um, those that know me know that I emphasize the importance of process and creating consistent, pro consistent processes across the, um, the city. And th therefore, when the position uh, underwent this recent change, I proposed advertising the vacancy. Um, such a step would have allowed us to explore alternate, alternative candidates and ideas, enhancing the credibility of this eventual appointee. And I was surprised when the mayor uh, opted against this approach, given his prior support to such pro processes when he was sitting on this side, but um, he opted for a different approach. Um, I really believe that economic development is where, why Ogden is in such a good place right now. And, uh, and, and having that robust commercial base really helps decrease the tax burden on the residents of Ogden and, and brings us additional revenue for the services that we rely on. Without businesses coming here, without smart financial uh, strategies, creating plans and having a vision, Ogden would definitely not be where it is today. Um, and although I really do believe that we have come a long ways, I don't think we're quite there yet. Um, I work in this space. I work in the economic development space. And this effort to build our community is not going uh, unnoticed. In fact, today I was just talking to another city. And they were just, they, they always look to us for this information, or uh, um, this inf ins uh, inspiration. And they just want to emulate us. And they want to know what Ogden's doing. And, and they literally are taking plays out of, our, out of our playbook on how to make their community better. Um, and it's, it's heartening to see, really, that we have plans like Make Ogden, and it's, and it's gaining traction. In fact, this person from a different city said to me today, the Make Ogden plan is a really awesome plan. So I know that we have several de developments in the queue and the pipeline, and I'm really hopeful that those get implemented. Um, as I watched the Women's Basketball National Championship, along with 19 million of my other closest <laughs> friends this weekend, I realized that a winning team doesn't just show up one night and become a national champion. Success requires recruiting, development, preparation, coaching, and a lot of practice. We've had a lot of practice. And you don't just become a national champion today um, without all that recruiting and coaching. And all of that doesn't stop just because you are the national champion today. But what happens is, is that national champion <laughs> team mental mentality is now looking to the future. Not just next year, but four years. How do I recruit? How do I develop? How do I do my team development? And much like what we're doing with the city, um, Economic development strategy uh, demands a really dedicated team and visionary leadership. And I think we're going to be able to realize our collective goals, such as making make Ogden plan, creating future plans, and making sure that we have those capital investments that we've relied on in the pipeline. I wish the process had been, process had been different, and I express my concerns about a long-term community and economic vision. Two issue, these, two issues have, these two issues have been my biggest hurdle. Um, and, and I've done a lot of soul searching and a lot of talking. And thank you again to those who have uh, <coughs> taken the time and, and hours with me to talk through this. Um, I've done my due diligence. And that's what you elected me to do, is to be that person to do my due diligence, to ask the questions, to ask the hard questions, and to know where we want to go. Um, but at the end of the day, I understand our role. Uh, thank you, Council Member Heyer, um, is to give it advice and consent, not to manage the operations on the administrative side. So although I have some concerns, <laughs> this is time to allow the mayor to develop his team and to keep Ogden moving forward. 
with that said, I'm really supportive of Jerry Johnson in this in this position. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Vice Chair White. Council Member Graff. Follow that. Thank you, Chair. Um, th this is a big deal. We're gonna we're gonna provide advice and consent on someone that will take a director's position in our city, and like everybody else throughout the city, uh, I've spent a lot of time preparing for this. I've read all the letters of support for Jared uh, that have come to our email, and I've listened to all the public input. I've asked questions of members of the community as I've considered this appointment. Uh, and it boils down to, in the end, I'm going to choose to support the mayor's candidate or I'm going to vote no. And as I consider each of those, as I thought about a no vote, it wouldn't be in rejection of the mayor's appointment or his choice, nor would it be a rejection of Jared as an individual. Um, in fact, over the past couple of months, I've had the opportunity to spend some time with Jared, and I've found that he matches up with the positive attributes that have been shared with us, both in this room and in writing. Um, he's generous with his time, he's experienced, he's thoughtful, he's knowledgeable, he's articulate, he's calm, he's personable. That's who I have found him to be. Instead, in considering a no vote, uh, it would be about the lack of a robust process to gather and interview candidates for this very important director's position. Important because in so simple terms, I think that community and economic development is responsible for keeping our property taxes down by creating a thriving business and employment community while also creating place that attracts business, investment, and a talented group of people to live in Ogden. A thorough search would have provided transparency in the process to our community, you all that live here, our taxpaying uh, base, to ensure our citizens have the best available talent, leading community and economic development for the betterment of all of our lives in Ogden. After all that consideration, uh, I will come down in favor of this appointment and congratulate Jared. Council Member Chiburka. Yes, well, I don't feel like there's much left to say, but um, I will just say that I really have appreciated all of the um, comments and the letters and the contact that I've received about Jared's appointment. And I don't know you very well, Jared, but honestly, I would only hope that one day people would say the nice things about me that they've said <laughs> about you. So I really, really honor and respect um, all the things that have happened. I don't think that people say these things lightly, I guess I would say. Um, although I am the person, one of the people that does um, think that we should do an open, transparent process that we've talked about many, many times in these kinds of roles, um, I certainly will support Jared, and I appreciate, um, again, everybody's outreach to us to let us know their experience, and I appreciate the great dialogue all of us have, I, we have had as a council and our conversations with the mayor as well. So um, I'm very excited to support you, Jared. Council Member Blair. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree. It's hard to say anything new. Everything's pretty much been said. However, um, it would mean a great deal to me also if you would all picture me as a big buff bearded guy. So um, that would really help this a lot. Um, I, this, I, this, was a, this was a great opportunity. Um, and I'll... I'm going to tell you what, kind of what I learned throughout this opportunity and through this, this process. Um, first of all, the first thing I learned is that Jared is a phenomenal person. I mean, phenomenal person. I, every person that's come, every person that we've, I've, I've asked, every person that I've reached out to has had absolutely nothing but positives to say about you. So it's... Um, it means a lot, not only to hear those things, but to also, and I just consider myself on the team, but to be part of the team that you're on, to be with someone of, of such high character. So congratulations to, to you um, for the person that you are and for the work that you do, because it, it, it resonates throughout this building and throughout our city, and that it's been neat for me to, to get to learn more about that, um, more about you and who you are. Um, which was one of my, one of my, whenever someone asked me how I felt about this, I always said I had minor concerns. I never had major concerns. I always had minor concerns. One of those was I didn't know you very well. 
And it doesn't help that you're in a suit coat tonight, because I was kind of under the impression you're the guy that doesn't wear a suit coat. <laughs> so that's throwing me off. But, um, um, but that, was, that was one of them. One of my concerns was that I just didn't know you very well. Um, and I'm excited. I'm excited to have the opportunity to get to know you better. I'm, have, I'm excited to have the opportunity to actually get to work with you. Um, to get to learn from you and to get to see you in action. So that's, um, like I said, I, it, it wasn't a bad thing to not, to not know you. Um, and maybe it's a good thing that you didn't know me. Um, but but I'm, I am excited to be able to have this opportunity to work with you and alongside you and to learn from you. Um, my other concern, again, not a big one, was that I kind of had a, a notion or a preconceived idea of what the CED director should look like or should be. I, this is, you're my third. I've, I've, I've given advice and consent on three. So, um, the way you'll be, you'll be my third. So, um, and I, I can say now I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to know who you are. I'm, I'm proud to know what you bring to the table. Um, that, is amazing to me that you've never said what you bring to the table. Everyone else has said that for you, and it's great. It's wonderful to hear everyone, literally everyone, talk about all the positives and, and, and the wonderful things you'll bring um, to this position. I, I'm very excited because I, I did know how great you are at your current job, and I, I, I applaud you for, for the work that you did there. Um, but I'm also excited to see what you do bring is, is you really want to provide the best product, not only for us, but for a developer, for a business, for every, everyone involved. And I, I applaud your, your willingness to, to go the extra mile and to make sure that everyone, everyone wins or everyone can win. And so I appreciate you doing that. Um, I've been known in the past to get a little emotional up here, and it's just because I love this city. I, I'm not gonna do it. Lock it in. Lock it up. Lock it up. <laughs> I'm not gonna do it. I do, I love this city. Um, and I, I truly applaud all those who, who, have, who feel the same way about this city that I do. And I, I can see that in you, Jared. I'm excited, I'm excited um, to support you um, because I really want you to succeed. And I, I feel like you've, you're put in a position that, that you can succeed. And, and, and there's going to be that success, the ripple of your success will, will reach throughout our whole city. And I'm excited to be a part of that. So I, I applaud you for the work that you've done. Um, I applaud you for the person that you are. And I, I, like I said, I'm excited to, to give you my full support and, 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 and watch you grow into this position. So. Congratulations. Thank you, Council Member Blair. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank everyone who uh, has stuck it out through this evening. It's, uh, we've had, it, it's, uh, it's been a long evening and- um, It's not nine yet. It's not yeah. nine yet, we, get, we still have time, right? So, <laughs> but I do want to say for those that have been here and, and watching online, like we have a terrific council, we really do. We have some amazing uh, individuals, we're, you can see the thoughtfulness, uh, the dialogue that goes on, you know, a, lot, a lot of those conversations one-on-one uh, -on -one and in our work session and here. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of our council. And, um, you know, Jared, I, I think uh, as we've gone through this process, I have gotten to know you. I think I feel pretty well. And um, I, I, I do appreciate all of those who have stood up and, and shared their appreciation and support for you, Jared. And, I said this last week, it's not often you get to attend your own funeral and hear what people are going to say about you, but you've had that two times now. So <laughs> um, when we were in a work session earlier tonight, earlier this afternoon, <laughs> um, we were looking at pictures of 100-year-old of 100, 100 pictures of these guys in suits standing there looking at putting in, in water lines and... Uh, and workers and and you know Ogden Ogden changes it, it you know we, we go through this progression over time and and I do believe that we stand on the shoulders of giants and we have that opportunity to uh, as Mayor Nadolski mentioned it's a it's a terrific honor to serve in these positions and 
and uh, shepherd or, or you know, be here in, in these couple of years that we have to try to make, make the best and, uh, of what we have. And, and I really do believe that Jared is the right man for the job at this time, and I'm excited to support him as well. And so with that, I'll call for a motion. Chair, I'd make a motion that we uh, complete the appointment of Jared M. Johnson as Community Economic Development Director for Ogden City. Second. I have a motion by Council Member Heyer and second by Council Member Myers to appoint Jared Johnson as the Community and Economic Development Director for Ogden City. This is a roll call vote. Council Member Myers? Aye. Council Member Blair? Aye. Council Member Chaburka? Aye. Council Member Graff? Aye. Council Member Heyer? Aye. Vice Chair White? Aye. Chair Ritchie? Aye. Congratulations, Jared. Yes, please, please come up, Jared, and we'll give some time to you uh, to share share your thoughts. If uh, if I get emotional, it's Don't your you? fault. Lock it up. <laughs> yeah, uh, lock it up. I'm not yeah. This is a, it's a huge honor, and it is not something that I take lightly. And uh, I am beyond words right now, a little lost at the moment. I want to thank Mayor Nadolski for the nomination. I really do appreciate that. Um, wasn't necessarily something that was on the radar that. You know, um, I enjoy doing my job, and I like working hard, and I love the people that I work with. Uh, so this is a, a huge honor. Um, Vice Chair, or excuse me, Chair Ritchie, I, I want to thank you. Vice Chair White, thank you. I thank you for expressing those items of concern. It tells me I have work to do, and I'm okay with that. It's... <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's important, though. I, I agree with you 100%. Community and economic development does need to make investments. They need to push. We need to keep those things going. I don't see any reason why we would take our foot off the gas and back away from the things that we've done. We will continue to move those things forward. I want to make sure that there's an understanding that just because I would always like to bring a team and collaboration, it doesn't mean that I can't make a decision that I won't make a decision or that I don't have a thought. But I also believe that there's always multiple ways to attack an item. And sometimes there's a better way than what you think there is. I have two quotes that I've lived by for a long time in my life that I got from my grandpa. And they're about decision making and they're about hard work. And the first one is a quote by George W. Cecil. And if you look it up, you'll see that I don't quote it word for word. I quote it what I remember saying as a little kid when my grandpa would talk to me about decision making and I, when I couldn't make a decision and he'd be like, well, you got to make a decision. You want to make the right decision. You always do, but sometimes not making a decision is the worst thing you could do. So he would always tell me, on the plains of hesitation bleach the bones of countless many who on the dawn of victory laid down to rest, rest and died because they wouldn't make that decision. They wouldn't make that. He says, you have to, you have to push, you have to move forward. Second one was always about hard work. Every time I'd get tired, I'm like, this is too hard. I don't want to do this anymore. And he'd always say, that which you persist in doing, right? You've heard it, right? So by Ralph Waldo Emerson, um, that which you persist in doing only becomes easier. Not that the nature of the thing has changed, but the power to do has increased. Basically saying, don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. And I've had those in my mind ever since I was a little kid. Uh, my grandpa would tell me those things, and, and I don't know why. They stuck. And, and I've always carried those things forward. I'm excited. All the people that have come forward and, and they've made comments, it's, it is, it's amazing. And I, pre I appreciate them beyond words. I think what's important, though, that I need to say to them and to all of you, 
is that I've gotten more from them than they've probably gotten from me. And that's the most important thing for me is I appreciate the, the ability to, to participate in different items with them uh, to go through and, and to, uh, to carry on with some, we've had some hard things and uh, they, they've been difficult. But this is an amazing team. There is no other team that I would rather be a part of. And it's important to me to always know that I am accessible to any of those individuals at any time because I see the hard work and the dedication that they put in and what they do because they do care and they love this city. We will always bring forth our best recommendation to you on what we feel after we have tried to vet it out, what we've studied, what we've gone through, and we'll present that to you. But at the end of the day, we also understand that we won't get everything we want um, and decisions will be made and we will always support those decisions and move those things forward. Um, I, I just, I do want to recognize the entire community and econ economic development team, the staff, all the different divisions that are there. Uh, they do so much. It is a, a wide ranging uh, department of the city, right? We go from the airport to building services, to planning, to community development, to business services and economic development, to our ACE team. Um, there's just, there, there's a lot. And I've been blessed over time, you know, it, and it's been a long time, but I've been blessed to be able to be parts of those in different times uh, throughout my career. And so I might not always have the answer, but at least I have a background and an understanding that I can lend support and lend help to get there um, to where we need to be. I, I'm really kind of a loss of words. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, I respect this group, this team. Um, this is a phenomenal city. There is no doubt about that. We, and we will continue to be leaders. Um, there is no reason why we shouldn't be, and there's no reason why we can't be moving forward. I appreciate your support. I thank you, and uh, I look forward to carrying on and, and doing my part and taking us to the next step. So thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, Jared. Congratulations. Yep. Thank you, Jared. Yep. Yeah, no, let's do another clap, right? Okay. All right, at this point we have, oh, Mayor, sorry. If, if you'll allow me. Oh, yes, please, <laughs> sorry. I, I need to express my appreciation with the most humility possible. This is a hard job. There are decisions required. I've never met your grandfather, Jared, but I hope he's proud that I made a decision. I did feel there was a time that we were under a crunch and there were pressures building upon us. There are things on our laps that are really hard. Uh, they're gonna require uh, strength and stability at the top. You'll hear about them and find out about them as we're, we're sharing them as we can and as they come up, but um, the public will all be fully aware of what the things we work on moving forward and I needed to stabilize Jared fast so that we could stabilize our future together. And I made a decision and I want you to know, Marsha especially, Council Member White as a colleague, Marsha as a friend and as a neighbor, I really respect what you shared tonight. I really appreciate the strength and the character and leadership you showed and what you shared. Thank you for that. And thank you also Council Member Graff Thank you to every council member who took time to get to know Jared the best you could in the time that you had. I knew early on I couldn't expect you to know him the way that I've gotten to know him since I took this position. You get to know a man and experiences and you get to know a person through challenge and hardship. Um, there has been absolutely no shortage of that for Jared. <laughs> I think his job's a lot harder than mine has been since I got here. Jared, thank you for stepping up 
step leaning in and helping me and helping us. I could not have done this. I could not be here without you. And I just couldn't imagine moving forward without him. I also couldn't imagine our team without him. I appreciated your comments because you talked about uh, women's basketball. And I actually personally prefer women's NCAA basketball and then women's tournament over the men's. It was way better. <laughs> I think you would know that Gino Ariama didn't recruit Caitlin Clark, but he never ever regretted recruiting, keeping, and supporting Paige Beckers. Not because one's better than the other, but because he does not regret the chemistry that she brings, the leadership she brings, the integrity, and what she, what she brings to that team at UConn, right? And that's, that's how I felt when I made the recommendation. I had no uh, real understanding it was gonna be this hard, <laughs> which is why I say these things with humility. And I want you guys to know that I respect the input that you've given me. Um, and I appreciate that you've respected the input and answers I've given back. I appreciate your support for Jared and for Ogden. And I really respect your care, your candor and your honesty and your remarks tonight. And I feel so comfortable knowing that the more you get to know him and see him and work with him, the more comfortable you're going to be like I am. That's how it happened for me. But it's going to take longer for you guys because you're not here every day. You also have day jobs and, and lives outside of serving part-time, right? So I want to thank you for your professionalism. This is exactly why we have the best city council. We do. Thank you for that. And finally, uh, thank you, Janice. Thank you for the nights that you've not had him. I'm really sorry for that. It's been a lot of them more than I uh, wanted. I've had great angst personally over it. Um, council member Graf, you asked about the timeliness of the letter to the council. It was a weekend that Jared was, uh, was at a softball tournament for his daughter and I didn't want him to miss that. And uh, that hits on me for the timeliness of the, le the transmittal, but it's also uh, a, a signal to Janice that I don't want to take him from you and from your, your family. I appreciate that you lend him to us during the day and that there come times where we had to borrow him for longer than we expected. But I want you to know that I don't want to, I don't want to be the kind of mayor that creates that kind of a situation for a family and for a father who cares so deeply for his, for his loved ones, okay? Because um, I want to be the same kind of father. Yeah. So thank you for supporting him and loving him. Thank you, Jared, for being the man that you are things that you expressed in the microphone today are the things that we have all come to know over time. And so thank you for sharing uh, so candidly and genuinely. Thank you. Next up on our agenda, we have public comments. So this is an opportunity to address the council on any idea or concerns of any topic. Please come to the podium and address uh, or state your name for the record and limit your comments to three minutes. And for those who are those who are uh, departing, thank you for being here. I appreciate uh, that support for Jared. Sorry to jump here, Sebastian Benitez again, <laughs> because my wife texts me maybe 100 times already. <laughs> Come on. Um, I want to express my, my happiness. Sean, Dre, uh, Graf, Blair, Angela, Marcia, Richard, and you. I am so grateful to be here. For the last, from 2015 to last, last year in November, before November, I come here with different attitude. My attitude was we can do it better in many ways, but now we have the right mayor, the right council team, I really appreciate your service. I know Richard, um, he don't know me too much, but I know him very well. And Marcia, you too. Anyway, I want to just thanks to you guys to be here and to run and I have the chance now to serve in the John Singular Duel with Blair, it's so fun, you know, and I don't know, he was running and I signed it the same day he signed. And after that, I told you, 
I will support you. I will help you because we need you here. We are really nice diversity people here. And I will not come frequently because I think you are the right team, you know. But I will mention a few things. I have just one minute. Today we have something really crazy for me. You deny the Kuhon Street. Do you remember last year when I come here for Birch Street? The same situation, nothing happened. That discussion we have today did not happen. And we will stay put the gate there. I think that is a really crazy. I get elected for Republican to be the delegate, the state delegate, because they trust me. And they asked me to ask to you guys to reopen, remove the gate, and make that street to connect again the East Bench to Weber State University. I trust you guys. You can do that. Because it was irregular situation how they closed the street. You know? I want to just express my love to you and um, usted me puede traducir cuando me equivoco. <laughs> Bien hecho. Bien hecho. Gracias. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bonnie Zuss, Ogden City Residents. This is Karen Webster, Ogden City Resident. I have a letter I'd like to give to the Mayor Nadalski and Ogden City Member Councils. Um, Aspen Village HOA at 700 North Monroe is requesting that Ogden City revise its Flip Your Strip program to include HOAs with townhomes. We applaud the city for being proactive on water conservation. But Ogden's Flip Your Strip program excludes HOAs with multifamily housing units. Since all homeowners of an HOA community own the commun common property equally, whether single family housing units or multifamily housing units, we fail to see the reason why multifamily housing units, HOA communities have been excluded from the program. As a result of denial to the Ogden's Flip Your Strip program, the Aspen Village HOA has been denied approval for the state's water conservation program. Aspen Village HOA is a community of 60 low-income homeowners in the Mount Lewis neighborhood, Census Tract 2002. Currently, data from the www.redfin.com shows that the median price for a townhome in Ogden is estimated at more than $70,000 less than a single-family housing unit. FFIEC data shows Census Tract 2002 has a poverty rate of over 11% with a family medium income of $68,900, well below the MSA median income of $109,300. We are a community of low-income homeowners that are seeking to do our part to conserve water and to be good stewards to our community. The city provides culinary water to the Aspen Village HOA property. The HOA has over 8,000 square feet of park strip to maintain with culinary water. This is precious life-saving or life-supporting water that is going to over 8,000 square feet of grass. We wish to convert the grass park strip to weather, I'm sorry, water conserva conservative landscaping and the cost of undertaking a landscaping project of the scale for our low-income community is significant. We are requesting to receive the same financial assistance provided to other homeowners in this important water conservation efforts. Please revise your program to fairly include all HOAs. It's a win-win situation. The city will benefit by achieving its goal of water conservation, and the Aspen Village HOA will benefit with conserving water and by lowering the huge water bill paid to maintain the park strip. Your consideration is greatly appreciated. Yeah, if you want to give the letter to Brandon, he will make sure that it gets to the mayor and, and the council. Okay. And give me a call. Thank you, Bonnie. Thank, Thank you, you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Bonnie, give me a call. Okay. Art, raise your baby. You can call me anytime. Oh. <laughs> Wait a minute here. Yes. She needs three more minutes yeah. if she used to babysit Bart. Yeah. Past 9 p.m. Yeah. I'm going to get in trouble. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, congratulations. Oh, my name's Malik. I'm here in Ogden. 
Uh, congratulations. I see a lot of new faces here in the council. If you don't know me, my name is Malik Dio. I'm a community activist and organizer. And uh, I see a lot of new faces. So congratulations to you and the ones who made it through re-election somehow. Congratulations to you too. Um, and uh, so uh, I'm here tonight to talk about the quota. So I know it's taboo for the council members to critique or criticize in any way the police department. So this is going to just go straight to the mayor. And Mayor Nadalski, I'm so happy you're the mayor. My family's excited. Me and Angie voted for you. My mom loves you guys. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you're here because I know you're going to, you've already shown by your list, you're going to make Ogden a better place. And I trust in my heart that you're going to do that. I know you're a good man. And, you know, we've, we've talked before. Um, but as far as the quota goes, you know, the, the chief has been misrepresenting what the quota is over time. It's, his story's been changing and evolving depending on how the news story's uh, coming out and reporting on it. Um, but I seen on the list of accomplishments, uh, there was no mention of the quota at all. So I know right now uh, it's a bipartisan bill uh, that's in the state level that's kind of dead, uh, dead on arrival type thing. It's, we don't know if it's going to you know, go through legislation yet or not. But my question is, is um, are you going to do the right thing by ending uh, the quota uh, that's being done by OPD? Or are you going to wait to see what happens with the legislation to see how you react to it? Um, that was my question this night. And thank you for everybody uh, taking the time to listen to me. And uh, Jared's not here, but man, he was spoken up so high. Hey, Jared. And they spoke. I, I don't even know you, but the way they spoke about you, I, I love you too, man. It was almost Christ-like. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Have a good evening. Free Palestine. Thank you, Malik. Nathan Sutherland, East Bench resident. So first, uh, I haven't been here in a bit, and that's because I was primarily very disappointed in our legislative branch. But I wanted to come and see what has occurred with the changes and with the executive and legislative that we have here in Ogden. And I'll first start with why I was disappointed. I was disappointed last year in what appeared to be the quickness and the lack of thought. Now, I know that isn't totally true, but the public-facing discussion that occurred with things like the Wildlife Rehabilitation Center, Union Station, Wonder Block, those were things that as, as a public, as, as constituents, me personally, I didn't see that the thought went into some of these things that we saw tonight. And so that's where I'm pretty excited. Because the mayor said that in one of his outcomes is to elevate the role and importance of communications and community engagement. And then we saw uh, Mr. Johnson discuss uh, what he plans to do and, and all of you voice your support for his plan. And so I really, really, really hope that we can see this change. Because what we had tonight was an awesome conversation on vacating a street, an awesome conversation about paint. We had in-depth conversation about things that are almost meaningless. Not really. Conversation that we didn't have when we were talking about spending tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money. I know that conversation happened in the back room. I know it happened with Mr. Fisher and his corporation, but it did not occur in the way that many, many constituents hoped. Now, again, I'm actually very hopeful that we'll see a change because there are changes that we can, we can make, like even just thinking outside the box, as the mayor said. Those discussions that we witnessed you all have tonight were amazing because it was the start of this open, this discussion, these things of what can occur. Trade lands, something the mayor is probably pretty familiar with. Why not trade a street that leads to nowhere for property that's pretty amazing? That gentleman said he had a bunch of property in Ogden. I don't know where. The heartburn that uh, Councilman Myers expressed he said he had heartburn in kind of discussing because of the situation that was going to occur with this interchange and with what could occur with imminent domain these things that this discussion was the discussion we all wanted and i appreciate it and i know that just the discussion you could hear in the background the whispers many other people appreciate it too so what i'll just say is alan jackson he's my favorite country artist and he said in his song little man but they seldom think about the little man that built this town before the big money shut him down. Let's continue to start thinking about the little man because that's the discussion that we start to have tonight. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you, Nathan.
Any other comments? Nope. Here we go. <clears throat> Welcome back. Ah, you just thought that since they didn't go, go first, you were going to have for me. Al Jones, area city curmudgeon. Uh, I uh, wanted to make a quick comment uh, about uh, Mayor Donalski's, Nadalski's speech. Uh, uh, one thing that really caught my attention was is all out for growth, go for growth, duh. Uh, infinite growth in a finite system is foolhardy and a recipe for disaster. Uh, sustainable growth is what we want. Very careful, very planned growth. Uh, and I want to warn the mayor and the city council of that. Uh, just op out and out open growth is not a good thing. Okay, uh, I do a lot of walking in town and I, I have a problem when, when I come up here and, and complain and things, I try to bring a solution, uh, but I'm at a little loss of a solution. So I'm, I, I apologize for just griping without a solution. Uh, I walk a lot. I trip on the sidewalks a lot. Our sidewalks are in deplorable shape. Uh, I understand that it's a money issue, that's a planning issue, and it's a difficult thing to wrap our heads around. Uh, my solution there is, can we please try to allocate some money in the budget to try and get some of our really bad sidewalks fixed? My second thing is garbage. Uh, I pick up garbage, I used to pick up garbage uh, with my little garbage picker upper. Uh, and I had to give it up for two reasons. One, well, kind of combined. One is, is that I was unable to carry that much garbage. And at one time there were some convenient garbage cans that I could throw those overloaded bags into and start a new one. They don't exist anymore. So uh, they're much fewer and far between. So that's a very difficult thing for me. It, it, it really pains me to see the sheer amount of garbage that is strewn on our streets, on our sidewalks, parking strips, on people's lawns. Again, that's not necessarily our issue. But uh, so anyway. I now only pick up cans, only aluminum cans, okay? One 10 block trip today, 40 cans. In that 10 block trip on a different street, I've come as high as 74 cans in a 10 block strip. That is absolutely deplorable. And to you. comment to what's his names, when was the last time we gave a ticket for littering in this town? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a we have a hand online, so let's go to Heath Sato and then yeah. Hi, uh, Heath Sato, Ogden resident. Um, I'm I'm buoyed to hear that. Uh, we're going to put a little more focus on um, reforming some of the RDA practices. As you know, that's been a, a thing of mine for many years now. And um, I wasn't pleased with the, the slight things done before. So I'm, I'm hoping we get some real change. And, and we started this year with, with one really good change at least. So I appreciate that. Um, the other thing... Uh, last week I had spoken to wanting, um, access to, uh, vote records by name instead of just totals. And I was told they were available. Um, and, you know, as part of the whole transparency, greater transparency and all that, I'm hoping, um, we can fix this, uh, I'm sure as part of the last administration's oversight, uh, 
um, our, our city recorder is great. She's always been absolutely wonderful to deal with, and I'm sure she's completely overworked. And so I don't want to have to, you know, make a records request just to get, I mean, she offered to do this, but these all should be online. I went to where I was told to go. It's kind of buried. We could better organize this, the city website. It'd be great if somebody from the city sat down with normal people and watched them try to navigate it. Um, but when I went to find eight council meetings where the final approved minutes were available um, since like, I think 2015, um, there are like eight in the last uh, year or so. Um, so uh, it would be great if that was just public record. I know that's not priority number one. We've got a lot to deal with, but I think um, people should know how they're being represented and have easy access to that without having to go through and, and, and find each vote on a, a Zoom video on Facebook. So I'd appreciate it if we could look at the website and how our records are um, publicly facing uh, for greater transparency. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? I always wondered what this goes to. <laughs> Angel Castillo, Ogden resident. Um, I listened to the work session today, and again, I'm very grateful that we have remote capability to be able to listen as I had uh, work things to do, and I had to make it to a pharmacy before it closed. Um, so I appreciate that commitment to allow people to be here and meet them where they are. Um, listening to the work session, I, I was heartened, and I really appreciated that there was a work group looking at the R2S. and. Um, it was nice, it was a good robust discussion, but this is what happens when something is asked from three minutes of public comment. Um, a, conditioner, a conditional overlay was not what I was suggesting at all. What I was suggesting, um, because you can do a quid pro quo with a developer, you want us to change this zoning, we're gonna spot zone that if you do this. Plenty of states do it already. And um, I just feel that in this market with so many people wanting to be here because we're amazing and the explosive growth that we have, we, we really shouldn't be giving away property, especially if we're, we wanna make sure that we have housing that our community can afford, which brings us to community land trusts. Um, Council member Heyer said, uh, surround yourself with the most intelligent people you know. Well, I've spent the last two years doing just that. And um, I have a certificate in community land trusts and I have a network of people in other cities. What are they doing? How does it work? And if you really want to have a lasting impact and create property for sale and or for rent that is always 20% below what current market rate is. Community land trusts are the way to go. We own the property, we keep the property, and it is run by the community land trust. There is participation from the city, but it's, it's a uh, two-thirds of the board are leaseholders, and then there's public stakeholders, and then there's community members. I'm happy to talk in length about everything that I've learned over the last couple of years. And if we want to make sure that we have actual opportunity for people to get into homes or live in apartments that are affordable, um, you can do anything with a community land trust that you can do with a standard real estate transaction. You can use HUD money, you can use federal money. It's just a different way of thinking. And it's not a new idea. Uh, community land trusts are almost as old as I am, and I'm 56. Um, there's about 475 of them in 46 states. And this is something that we should be looking at. Thank you. Hi, Travis Pete. 
I think the dynamic for me is this is uh, that I've seen the whole night was accountability and we celebrated someone's accountability before us and, and gave them a great position. I think the accountability that I see is the general plan is still the general plan even if we're in the process of rebuilding it. So I would challenge each of you as council members, if you are over a district, open the general plan. Mr. Briarley brought a hard copy up and was able to reference it. If you don't have a hard copy or prefer the electronic copy, reference those that you're, for which you're responsible. If you're at large, I heard a term a long time ago, survey large fields but cultivate small ones. If you're in a large member, I would challenge you to survey the large field and then cultivate inward. For those of you that are responsible for each different municipal district, study your general plans. The Lynn Community Plan still has an old map from who knows when, even though it was updated in 2002, still the old plan. Everything that's come before you with regards to rezoning, still an old plan. And yet then we don't even ask our developers for a development agreement. We'll rezone, oh, just build what you want. Okay, there you go, anything that the new zone allows. <coughs> and a lot of these things can be, cure, can be cured with a development agreement. It was challenged a few weeks ago whether we're going to concentrate poverty again on the IGA block. And just because someone's low income does not necessarily mean that they're a bad person. And I think that's the dynamic, but the separation of, of, of resources needs to happen. Imagine Jefferson came in as champions. The Portland building came in as champions. The Olean Walker Housing Trust Fund came in that says 20% will be this, 80% will be this. And then the council a week ago says, oh, we don't have any control over that property, meaning the IG block. We bought it all and surrendered it with no development agreement. Of course we're not gonna have any say. But I think the dynamic and everything that was expressed today, there's the aspect of altruistic purposes that we can go back to these development partners and say, here's what we've brought, here's our vision, how can you help us to accomplish it? Not here's the Union Square property and a million dollars, but we're not gonna advertise it, just have it under the last administration. Horrible, deplorable actions, and yet rubber stamped by the council at that time. It's, 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 it's unfortunate to me. Yip Robertson, who wrote uh, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, also set, wrote the song, Once I Build a Railroad. Now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? That's the dynamic. We've turned our back on so many things that we've neg neglected the heritage and history and, and, and the very fiber. And we say those that don't learn from history are condemned to repeat it. We need to learn from our history. We need to preserve it. And so I thank you for your time. Thank you. And, and simply the last part, the general plan has high priorities. Please look at all of those. We'll see where we are in it. Thank you. Thanks, Travis. Okay. Any other, no other comments? Mayor? Comments from Mayor? I, I tried to make notes, so yeah. see what I would add. Um, I, th I think the first was the comments from Sebastian Birch Creek closure. Sebastian's a neighbor of mine. Yeah. He's, a, he's a good man. Um, he's frustrated by not being able to go through Birch Creek to get to Weber State. And um, there is there is a process for that that involves uh, university decision making as well. I, I, th I don't know the technical terms for it, but when we live in a city that has a university campus that we don't own, they have their own police department, they have their own facilities they have their own planning and and so on so there's a there is a process that has to take place administratively for those sort of things to happen um the east bench as we all know that live on the bench i do representing district four i know others do as well that there is a lot of traffic on the east bench um every time we make a change in the east bench traffic with a stop sign or a closure of a road it changes the the pattern and the dynamic and it's not um it's not something that we should be doing lightly, and I'm glad in this case we didn't. We have a good partnership at Weber State on making those decisions, and because what happens is engineers are hold, held to standards and criteria, and they have a personal liability with the stamp that they put on the work. And it's really important that when they're evaluating those sort of changes that they're done in a way that um, meets a standard that is a national standard by engineering standard, et cetera, or else they're operating outside those standards, I think it's concerning. So when we make those, interventions on specific areas um, it does change the 
a change of the game elsewhere. And I think uh, Councilmember Blair, you expressed in the past that you've seen a reduction in traffic on Taylor Avenue on the other side, potentially as a result of that, although not enough, right? So we've got more work to do in that regard. I think that the closure that was referenced creates another about another minute uh, to go around to find another avenue where we've provided roundabouts and, and appropriate infrastructure to accommodate the, the pressure and traffic. It looks like we got more work though to do on, on mm -hmm. uh, Taylor on the other side. So yes. that'll, that's going to keep being the case every time we make a change. So um, appreciated the letter on the Birch Creek or on the uh, Aspen Village flip the strips. I hadn't considered that. So I'm happy to entertain that. Thanks for getting the letter. Look forward to a copy. Uh, Malik, thanks for the question. I did not specifically address that. I didn't know I'd be asked. So I appreciate that you asked me so that I could give an answer. Um, during the campaign, that was obviously a topic. Um, it was something that I expressed concerns over. And um, I, no secrets, I, asked, I met with Chief Young, um, asked him to evaluate op options for how we um, evaluate our officers um, to revisit or to, lo to look closely at the weighted criteria. And he is uh, really open to considering some options that are based on um, uh, interactions rather than a weighted criteria based on the outcomes of those interactions. Um, what I don't want to happen is that we do, I don't want to give an order to the police that I'm not a police officer and I also don't have the data on, at my fingertips. I don't want to make a decision that uh, could be reckless or uh, or not the best decision possible. But I also want, so I want data to be involved and I want there not to be pressure through um, politics and emotion that comes with um, some of the other dynamics that we've seen. So with the legislative session, I was aware of the bill. It wasn't a bill that we were um, intimately involved in, uh, but it's the it, it was a bill that affected the whole law enforcement community. And I didn't know what the outcome would be and I didn't know if other bills were coming. And so I asked Chief, I said, I, we'll revisit this when the session's over so that if there's any changes made to law, that any decisions we make moving forward, we reflect that. So um, the session ended, uh, Chief went on vacation with his wife, Chief got back, we met, we talked. Um, he's really open to some uh, data-driven decisions that are um, also done collaboratively with the input from employees. I've met with the our Police Benefits Association and the FOP, they've expressed this uh, desire with the Chief uh, to to revisit some of the numbers there, I think they date back to as long as 2016 or 2017 when we first developed them. So it's important to me that we do this not in the vacuum, um, that we do it in a collaborative way and in a data-driven way. So that's what I've asked the chief to do. Um, his last monthly address to employees, uh, he announced that, that, he's, that we're forming that committee. And so I expect that to take place immediately and um, I'll just await the committee's input on what they recommend for that. So you're welcome. Thank you for asking. Um, I can put my glasses on for the next one here. Oh, town curmudgeon, infinite growth. I didn't mean to, uh, <laughs> I'm not capable of the word infinite. So I know it didn't come from me, but if I led you to believe that I support infinite growth, uh, I stand corrected, I don't. I do, however, believe it's important that we manage the growth that's coming. I remember in the campaign, we often were asked the question, what's the biggest challenge facing Ogden? And I said, it's growth. Growth is coming no matter what. We're seeing it all across the state, across the West and in the country. And to me, it's not about opening the doors to infinite growth. It's about planning for and managing our growth and doing it in a thoughtful way, in a collaborative way. So that's my opinion. So um, on the, hang on. Oh, on the sidewalks, I feel you. <laughs> um, we've got more work to do on the sidewalks, there's no question that, that that stuff's expensive and there's not a, an easy revenue source for it, but we'll do everything we can to, to max, maximize our impact for sidewalks. Um, for the garbage picker upper that you had to forego, I'm sorry for that. Uh, May 2nd, we are having our make a difference day. You're right, there's too much garbage and in the spring, when the snow melts, it's even worse. So that's why we organize a spring cleanup and we do it through a volunteer effort. It's citywide. Our employees uh, are out in mass 
where currently we have a volunteer coordinator. She has coordinated a number of projects for our staff and our community to do <laughs> in specific areas of need. So if you've got a need or a project you want to do and want to coordinate, we got your back. Let's help support you to do that. Thank you for everything you're doing to pick up the trash. I've got, I've got a picker upper for anyone who wants one who's going to use it. I got to see what a picker upper is, and I'll, maybe I'll take you up on that. I'll get you one. Okay. The previous mayor never used his the one that I used. <laughs> I can't judge that yet, not knowing what a picker upper is, but we'll get there. Um, on the council votes, I, uh, I'm thankful to have some smart technology staff around us. Uh, I know that our recorder's office, Mike McBride uh, and his team, I know you, Brandon. I'm sorry. I'm not a council member anymore, but I can speak for the character and quality of the man. Um, I'm sure there's something we can figure out. I'll defer to your authority on your side, but I know there's sort of, isn't there like a day of update about the total vote and maybe another day update the next day? And then we've got, to, we've got official minutes. So yeah, they, I, I don't know what the confusion is, but I'm, I'm an open ear or whatever we can do to help facilitate what you guys want to do. We're there, we're there for you. Um, did I miss anything? That's, I think that's what I got. Did okay. I miss anything? All right. I'm sorry, dude. I missed Travis. Um, you're right. Accountability matters. The general plan matters. It also matters that we update the thing. And um, sorry, this let. We, we can definitely have conversations offline in terms of this back and forth. I'm sorry to shut this down that way, but you know yep. what I mean? Yep. We're, yeah. I'll just, I just wanted to speak to him and I'll just say that, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks for the input. I'll talk to the planners and if you can help me get a seat at that art show that you invited me to, I'd appreciate that. I want to make sure I'm present for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any comments from council members? I just wanted to thank you colleagues. I, t tonight was a little bit messy when we were talking about some of those things, but I very much appreciate the respectful dialogue that we are able to have, <laughs> even though we disagree. I, thank you so much. I, you guys are my heroes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Motion. Just w really one, one quick thing. Um, if you go to Guiding Our Growth, um, it's a statewide effort. You, you might uh, enjoy some of the survey results of um, what other people said about our community and how they want to see it grow and what they want to see in our community. Um, so it's kind of an interesting, just as, since we're talking about growth. So Thank you. guiding our growth, I don't know what it's, you, you Google it, it'll come up, I'm sure. <laughs> Sounds good. I, I think I missed a question about land trust from Angel. Did, does someone, can someone help me with the answer? I am scribbling notes and I don't want to overlook anything, but. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. community review. review, community land trust as a tool, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, ha happy to do that. It's actually something I've looked into before. <laughs> it's it's somewhat technical, but um, I, I there's certainly merit in looking into it and evaluating it. I'd yep. ask for expertise on the team to evaluate it, though. So, make that note. Here, motion Thanks. to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn and a second by Councilmember Myers. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned. Yeah.